Good evening. I call to order the regular meeting of the City Council, City of Lakewood, Colorado, October 8th, 2018 at 7 p.m. in Council Chambers. Will the clerk please call the roll? Paul? Here. Johnson? Here. Vincent? Here. Beta? Here. Here. Franks? Here. Royball? Here. Gutwine? Here. Skilling? Here. Harrison? Here. Abel? Here. LeBure? You have a quorum. Great. Well, good evening. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening and um, welcome those who may be tuning in on Channel 8 or checking us out on a later date. I ask that if you do have a cell phone, please put it on silent. And uh, if you could join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, we'll remain standing for a moment of silent prayer. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, so this is the first public comment period. And I think Margie's still waiting for folks to sign in, so I will read uh, my script, which says, I will read those names from the public comment roster and ask that you line up on both sides of the room in the aisles near the podium. If you have not signed up to speak, please stop by the clerk's desk and sign the roster, which will be there. This will help us not only with our record keeping, but keep your contact information so that we can get back to you um, if you have a question or a concern that we need to follow up with. Please note, in order to keep our meetings from running too late into the night, we ask those of you who wish to agree with a certain speaker, rather than coming to the podium and repeating what was already said, perhaps you will be kind enough to stand at the appropriate time in support. I'll be sure to take count of those in favor and those opposed, and that count will be part of the public record. Uh, you will have three minutes, and this little box here will be green for two and a half, yellow for half, and then at three we'll politely try to wrap you up. Keep in mind, public comment is for non-agenda items. So if you'd like to speak on anything else other than the first, first reading ordinance, there'll be a separate public comment period. So if you're here to speak at the public hearing on the budget, that will come after this uh, public comment period. So with that, I have Mr. Vaughn. Good evening. My name is Newt Vaughn. I live in Ward 5. A few months ago, we had a thing passed to give money to a charity. Now we're telling us, and at that time we were told that the city had plenty of money. Now we're told they don't have plenty of money to fund the things they need to fund because they need to keep the Tabor money. I'm a little confused, quite frankly. I think we can be safe, a little safer for police officers if those little red and blue lights on the top of these patrol cars was honored. We sat at a sign with red and blue lights on top of a pickup one night to warn of a war an accident ahead and one of those speed signs was in front of us. The speed limit was 40 miles an hour and there were people passing that sign and passing us at over 50. People slow down. 20 miles an hour is plenty fast enough to go past these things. These people don't turn those lights on just to hear, see them glance off of the side of the buildings. They're warning you of a hazard. When they're moving, pull over to the right and get and stop. Give them a chance. You're not giving these people a chance. Back in the 70s and 80s, I worked out at 80th and Wadsworth in Arvada. It's seven miles from Alameda to that 80th and Wadsworth location. And I'd watch a person weave in and out of traffic, passing me and others, to be right in front of me at the light at Alameda and Wadsworth. He gained 17 feet the length of my pickup. So I don't know what you're trying to prove. 
take a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon and take a drive and find an alternate way home from work because the intersection might be closed or the road might be closed. We have more problems with that than you can shake a stick at. You need to slow down. You're not going to gain anything by driving 10 miles an hour over the speed limit or 20 miles an hour over the speed limit inside of town. Another 10 miles an hour is 10 miles in a minute, in an hour, on the open highway, if you can maintain it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Mace, and then Ms. Wolfram, Mr. Strott, Mr. Batava, and then Mr. Zulak and company. Good evening, Mr. Mace. Give me two seconds, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. The reason I'm here tonight is because I'm going to bring up a concern right around me of the Marsh Station crossing apartments. And that concern I have already spoke with Council Ransom about. But the city needs to do something right around the Lamar Station and the speeders. Because if they don't, somebody's going to get hit. The lighting down by Lamar Station crossing is terrible. At night, it is bad. You can't see five feet in front of you. It is so bad. Um, there's times I come home at 2 o'clock in, in the morning. And you can't see, like I said, five feet in front of you. The city needs to put extra lighting in that area, plus a sidewalk. Thank you. Thank you. This is Wolfram. Good evening. Mr. Strott, Mr. Vitava. Hi, I just want to make sure I'm Welcome. in the right part of the agenda. I'd like to talk about the sustainability plan. <laughs> Is that the, am I correct in speaking now or should I speak at a lit, another? So this is general comment. We're, we're talking about the budget. If it's budget related. I believe it's probably budget related. So. Okay. Okay. Sure. We'll call you back. I'll make sure you get oh, on this gotcha. other sheet. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. No, thanks. Thanks for asking. Mr. Strott. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks. So um, I live in Ward 5 across the street from Bear Valley Church, and things are starting to get a little weird around there. Um, in the past two weeks, uh, I've, I take my dog for walks around 7 in the morning, and in four different parks, I've seen five different homeless people sleeping in the parks. So those parks are Edinburgh. There's a guy that sleeps in his car. Uh, I've seen two separate instances at Kendrick Lakes one at Cottonwood, and then one at Four Mile. Um, second thing is the parking situation, especially on Sundays, is getting kind of bad near Bear Valley Church. Um, people are blocking our driveways in the Kendrick Lake squads. It's a high density you know, housing area. And I need to get some information about what can be done about that, possibly painting the curbs to let those guys know where they can't park or you know, resorting to getting permitted parking. So that's it. Great, thank you. Mr. Batava, come on down. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. First of all, thank you for helping me change my tire along with Shannon uh, when we had the CCU forum. Um, second of all, I'm gonna bring up a couple different subjects that if I have the time, um, storm drain fees again. Enterprise fund, which, you know what my, basically my stance is on that is that, you know, it got doubled a couple of years ago and now because it's an enterprise type thing, it's not subject to Tabor, if I'm, if I'm correct, if, if I remember the way that it was set up. Um, the issue that's come up now is the individual sanitation districts 
um, I live in Alameda Sanitation District, and I lived o live over in Westford Condos. Um, they've imposed a $150 fee per, per household for sewage. And our HOA, because we have a private sewer system, um, is going to be less, and it'll be $3,900 a year. On top of the um, storm drain fees, which are over $6,000 for us, it's a hit to our budget of $10,000 every year for storm drain and sanitation. I can't seem to get through. There's a, a set policy in place as far as impermeable soil, and all my talks with public works gets me nowhere. We have retention ponds that the city required us to have. Um, unless it's a heavy rain, our water never leaves our property. It sits in retention ponds and everything else. Yet we have to pay the same thing that, let's say, Mile High or CCU would because they've got flat land. Um, we're hurting. We're hurting as an HOA. We're hurting as individuals. Um, we're going to have to increase, again, this year, our HOA fees to our homeowners because every time we turn around, either the city or the sanitation district is hitting us. Um, I, for that reason, and I, I, because we hide these things under fees instead of going to the um, people and asking for increased taxes, I can't support for the city to hold um, the Tabor refunds that are due to us. We need them. We need them badly because of the increased cost to everybody. Um, there, I also had a request in through Request Lakewood that was submitted on September 20th. It was sent to finance to answer my questions, and so far nobody's gotten back to me. Um, it has to do with storm drain fees, and the city of Lakewood also has a sanitation district, and I was asking how they're interconnected and everything. Vince did try to get a hold of me on the phone. I haven't called him back, but I really would like an answer from the finance department. I'm tired of talking to Public Works. Thank you so much, and have a good evening. Thank you, Matt and Pam. You guys are pooling. There you go. Will you hand that to the clerk, please? So that'll give you up to six minutes. Okay. <clears throat> hey, good evening. Thank you for the time to approach y'all. Um, my name is Matt Zuschlag, and I'm a small business owner here in, uh, in Lakewood, and I'm a co-chair to the Life Saving Alliance, which is the ballot initiative 7C, and we're asking for uh, your support and endorsement for, uh, for that 7C as a yes. So quick background. So uh, West Metro Fire, it's their, it's their funding initiative, and the strategy behind this is to put a floor uh, in the declining tax assessment rate that's been happening with, with the growth in residential uh, property values. It's not a tax increase. It's, it's specifically um, designed to not uh, be a tax increase. It's the whole strategy there is a kid to create a floor uh, to stop the declining uh, revenue stream for them. 70% of the West Metro Fire's operating budget is sourced from this initiative or from um, this uh, residential rate assessment. And um, the objective is to create stability for long-term planning. And as a, as a business owner, with my background, I could not imagine trying to uh, look forward years down the line and not have uh, confidence or assurance of having the revenue stream to be able to support uh, capital investments and in, in planning for your business, which is exactly what West Metro is having to face. We've, they've seen a 50% 50% increase in call uh, traffic in the last uh, decade. 70% uh, of those calls are uh, uh, emergency service related calls. And uh, firefighters today and EMS respond to a service call every 15 and a half minutes in their footprint that they that they serve. So demand's growing. Our residential, um, we've well, seen them both residential and business growth in this area is just taken off, and they're they're seeing the same thing. It's no surprise that they have an increase in their uh, their call activity. So again, the plan is to try to create a floor to minimize the reduction in, in loss of operating planning if they can have going forward. Um, they also, so that I'm sure you, you, you all probably know this as well, they are ISO 1 certified, which speaks to the caliber of the West Metro fire that uh, 
that we uh, enjoy both in the confidence in the services they provide to our community, but also uh, both for residential and business, their ISO 1 rating allows us to be able to see a savings in our insurance um, premium as a result of that level of ISO certification. It's a 1 to 10 score, 10 being not good and one being the best that you can get, and that's what they do. If we don't get this support and they don't get the initiative of a 7C pass, they run the risk of losing that ISO certification because the hard reality is it will mean taking trucks out of service, taking personnel out of, uh, out of service, and not make an investment in the long-term plan that's necessary to maintain the level of service that they do provide our community. So again, we ask for your support um, and endorsement for a yes and valid initiative 7C. Thank you. I'm the other co-chair, Pam Bales. Um, my day job is the president of the West Metro Chamber, but I am here and I am co-chairing this as a mom um, because this is why Matt and I speak together. He has to do all of this stuff so I can get this out. Uh, so my son fell four years ago off of a third story balcony and he would have died. He should have died without West Metro. Um, the quick response, the fact that our firefighters are paramedically trained, there would have been no way that my son would have survived. If we are looking at decreasing the amount of money and the floor, like you said, I mean, we advocate for businesses at the West Metro Chamber. I don't know how you would do a business without knowing what you're going to do for your budget. If we have to cut firehouses, we have to cut fire personnel, um, People want to pick up the phone and know that when they dial 911, someone's going to be there. But you don't really know that you need that person to be there until you need it. It could be your spouse. It could be your brother, your sister, your mother. We're the most aging population in the entire state. There are a lot of these calls. I, I would, okay, I'm going to watch this. Um, after Patrick fell, I would go back to the fire station that saved my son, and we would bring dinner, we would bring gift cards, and there would always be older people there. They would bring cookies. And I talked to one of the couples one time, and the guy said, you know, I work, and if they weren't there for my disabled wife, I don't know that she would be alive sometimes when I would get home. I'm just saying public safety is something that is extremely important to everyone. People take it for granted. We still have to pay these firefighters. We have to make sure that our public safety is number one. And so that's why I'm co-chairing this with Matt. So we do ask for your support on 7C. Yes, on 7C. Great. Thank you both. Uh, John Henderson and then Randy. And if anybody else wishes to speak, please uh, come on down and stop by the clerk's desk and sign in. Good evening. Great to see you all again this evening on a rainy, cold Colorado evening. On October 22nd, 2007, almost 11 years ago to the day, this council, through your predecessors, entered into an agreement, a contract. One provision of that contract was that you, the city, would loan $3 million dollars to the Green Tree District, the three dinos over at Dinosaur Ridge, for the construction of the C-470 intersection. The other part of the agreement was that the three dinos would pay back that $3 million. They promised, as a part of that agreement, to issue bonds almost a week later on November 6, 2007. They promised to repay the debt of $3 million through bonds and possibly other revenues collected by the district. They never issued those bonds. They've made no effort to repay the city. And in a key provision in the agreement, they said they shall, shall, mandatory language in a contract, use all their best efforts to issue bonds. They have not done anything except in 2015, District 1, which is started out as one acre of the 150 or so, 
and is now about 10 square feet, District 1, passed a sales tax of 3 percent for District 1, which I believe is 10 square feet. You are now at a crossroads with respect to this obligation to repay the taxpayers $3 million, excuse me, plus interest, which they agreed to pay at 7 percent, which now totals $3 million plus $2,310,000 for a total of $5,310,000. This is a debt that is owed to the taxpayers, and you are in a position to enforce this agreement. Because what is happening now at those sites is commercial developers who have no interest and have expressly stated in their public hearings they are not issuing bonds, no interest whatsoever, issue bonds. Thank you, sir. Your time's up. Thank you. Yep. Randy, come on down. Mr. Henderson, your glasses are here. I think you left your glasses. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> My name is Randy Hyman. I'm a Ward 1 resident. Thank you for your time tonight. I'm here representing Lakewood Elks Lodge 1777. I can't make it often due to our lodge meetings on Monday nights conflicting, but this Monday night works, so I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm here to, rep to support my Ward 1 representatives, Randy Johnson and Charlie Abel. Thanks for what you do for us. Um, Lakewood Elks has kicked off our charity drive, which concludes on Saturday, December the 1st with the charity ball. We have a lot of fun activities at our lodge and contribute to many charitable causes in our community. Veteran, veterans and youth programs are just a couple of the programs we're involved with. We are located behind the Chicago restaurant at Colfax and Newland, which most people are familiar with, across the street from world famous Casa Bonita. Anyone interested, stop by at our lodge or look us up at liquidelks.com or elks.org for the national website. There are more than 50 lodges in Colorado and thousands of, nation, of lodges nationwide. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Anybody else? All right, I'll close public comment. The Elks Club is a fantastic or organization and uh, always looking to grow its membership. So, we certainly have an increase in homelessness throughout uh, the city of Lakewood. And again, it's something that we're trying to tackle with all the cities and the county. And we're taking different actions, but the visibility is increasing. And uh, the resources really aren't, aren't adequate in Jefferson County. So that's something that our city managers and, and the county administrator, administrator are working on in the short term. And then also in the short term, emergency sheltering type op options at churches and things along those lines. I'd encourage uh, you to reach out to your council members with the church issue and the parking, councilors Gutwine and um, Harrison, to try to see if you can all get together and figure that out. Uh, for 7C, we're not formally endorsing uh, anything on the ballot this year, but um, there's many folks who are supporting personally, and I think that... Uh, You'll hear from them. You've got to be careful, I think, what we can say. But thank you for coming out on that as well. And then any other questions that remained, we'll make sure that we have some follow-ups if you had not heard back from staff. So thank you. All right. So item five. Please read that on the record. First public hearing on ordinance 02018-19 
adopting a revised budget for the year 2018 for the city of Lakewood, Colorado, and further adopting the annual budget for the city for the fiscal year beginning on the first day of January 2019 and ending on December 31st, 2019, estimating the amount of money necessary to be raised by levying taxes for the year 2018 to defray the cost of municipal government of the city of Lakewood, Colorado for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2019 and ending December 31, 2019, estimating the amount of money to be derived from other revenue sources and setting forth the appropriations for each fund. Okay, so this is uh, a unique item in that our budget has two public hearings. So this will be our first and we will have a presentation by City Finance Director and Treasurer Larry Dorr. Good evening, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and members of City Council. Once again, Larry Dorr, City of Lakewood Finance Director and City Treasurer. We're just waiting for Madam Clerk to queue up our PowerPoint slides. And we're all sad that there's no Rockies game tonight, but we have the Lakewood budget hearing to keep you entertained. And I'm just going to jump right into it for you as soon as we get this first slide. Um, there may be those in the audience or watching at home live on the internet or watching a recording of this for whom this could be their first interaction with the City of Lakewood's budget and its process. So my remarks and PowerPoint slides will have just a little bit of new information for you, Mayor, and members of City Council. There's just a, little, just a few updates in there. But I've oriented my presentation and comments uh, for those uh, for whom this may be their first experience with the Lakewood budget. So thank you for indulging me a little bit of time for those who uh, may be in the audience um, and can benefit from that. A lot's gone on in the budget process uh, to reach this point. You know, it really begins each year in council's planning session, and that occurred in February. That really sets the tone for everything that city staff uh, and directors are working on, of course, uh, in addition to our 30 uh, budget coordinators in preparing the draft budget. Uh, and probably the first real public event surrounding that is really the preliminary presentation with our budget and audit board. Our budget and audit board is uh, composed of three city council members, council members Bida, Harrison, and Libior, and also three citizen members. We currently have a vacancy, but the two filled positions are filled by Donald Tallman and John Ludwigson. We preview that budget for the board in order for them to gauge our proposed estimates for revenue growth, our you know, cost escalation and proposed projects. It's done at a very high level, but it's a great test for the reasonableness of all of the uh, estimates and um, projections in the budget. And once we've done that, we really proceed to the next step in the process, and that's the production of the city's full, full budget book. We've, we've done this in accordance with the requirements of the Government Finance Officers Association, uh, such that all of the data presented can very thoroughly allow the public to understand what's going on at the city and trends and changes. And if you only really have one opportunity to spend a short amount of time on this uh, pretty large document, I would really propose that you take a look at the city manager's budget message. It's really a, a narrative and brings to life the budget uh, in a way that uh, I think uh, summarizes uh, these things quite well. This budget document's been available for council for a month now. Uh, hard to believe it's flown by, but since September 7th, council has had a chance to have this document. And of course, it's made available on the city's website, lakewood.org, uh, for the public to view as well. And uh, once again, we will not be printing a final version of this or a revised version. We just have our working copy, the proposed, and that's in keeping with our sustainability practices. But we will have a final budget updated on liquid.org for the public and for the city's creditors and anybody else who might be interested in it. 
After the publication of the proposed budget, we had a council study session on September 17th. I was joined at the podium by my colleagues, our public works director, police chief, and director of community resources to uh, really describe all of the new things that are coming for 2019. But we also provided an update on last year's budget and how projects are progressing, how we're doing in terms of police recruiting and the like, um, and really kind of dig into the budget at a much more detailed uh, type level. Mayor, as you mentioned, we do have two public hearings for the budget. That's unusual. I'm not aware of any other ordinance that requires uh, two public hearings. And I think that speaks to the city's desire to have public involvement. And after my comments, uh, I do have one question from a council member. I'll address that. And then it'll be time for the public uh, to speak on the budget. Um, and then really the last thing to do is, is two weeks from now. We, we've allowed as much time as possible uh, so that the budget can be adopted on October 22nd. That is the last possible meeting for council to adopt the budget uh, prior to the deadline required under the city charter. And that's designed so that we can get as much input and have as much participation in the process as possible. Just to kind of overview what goes into the budget, and this sort of folds into my next comments, I want to give this process outline. The first thing we do is estimate our income. The reason being, we can't control that. We can't have a mill levy and an assessed value and have a nice fixed amount of income and then work on our expenses from there. Because the city is sales tax based, those those purchases that drive sales tax, whatever they may be, uh, they're discretionary uh, in many instances, and that really creates a little volatility. I'll talk a little bit about how we manage that, but we can't control the income to the city, but what we can control are expenditures, and we prioritize those. Uh, they fall into two main categories, our programs and personnel, which is really three-fourths of the budget, and then our capital projects and construction. And we have a lot of detail on each of those, of course. At the end of the day, we also want to save for a rainy day because we've had uh, a very substantial rainy day just last year at the Colorado Mills. That was uh, probably about a $4 million hit to the city's finances and something that uh, we were well prepared for, uh, but something that we need to keep in mind for the future. And I do have a little update for City Council on this. A couple of our neighboring cities have uh, finished their audits, and I can kind of give you a few more stats on how the City of Lakewood's reserve funds stack up against some of our neighbors. And then last but not least, I use this expression, and you heard the uh, city clerk refer to this in the title of the ordinance, and that's the word fund. And really, a fund is just a set of accounts. It's really a separate pool of income and expenses that we separate. Uh, for example, we have an open space fund, and those open space revenues and expenditures are just for the purpose of acquiring and maintaining open space, uh, and so they're segregated from our general funds. I always use the analogy in the, in the household of the Christmas club, uh, you know, those funds are set aside, or the vacation fund, you know, the family saves for that throughout the course of the year, and then you can take a vacation, you know, over the summer, whatever the case may be. So. We do have a lot of different funds, but what you find is that two-thirds or twice as much as everything else combined is in the general fund. Uh, so most of my comments, I beg your pardon, all of my comments tonight will be uh, based on the, on the general fund. So jumping back a couple of slides, I mentioned that we start with income. And as you can see, the lion's share of income to the city and its general fund is the sales and use tax. The use tax is, is not very well understood. It works a lot. It's a complement to the sales tax. And if you purchase a car, uh, you pay motor vehicle use tax and not a sales tax. That's a technical difference, but I use the words up here and I think it's appropriate uh, you know, to have that present. Uh, and then you'll see another visible uh, source of revenue that was mentioned by one of the earlier speakers, and that's property tax. That's a substantial source of revenue to the city. But if you purchase something or have it delivered uh, to your house, or if you purchase it within the Lakewood borders, you're going to pay a 7.5% sales tax. And of that 7.5%, 3% of the sales tax goes to the city. And you can see the other agencies, the bottom one being Regional Transportation District and Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. So those things really drive the income to the city and, and in turn drive the expenditures, uh, which of course all appropriations are approved by city council. At our study session, I showed this slide. This was the June economic forecast, and it's since been updated by the governor's office and the legislature. But the reason I presented this slide is you'll notice that uh, there's quite a disparity 
really. Uh, it seems the governor's office is very optimistic about this current period, less so about the next one, and the legislature has it reversed. And what I loved about this is uh, on the 20th of September, they both released their updated economic forecast and they both moved closer together. Uh, I thought that was just uh, a very uh, unusual. These are volatile times because I've never seen a spread between these two economic forecast groups quite like this. By the way, they didn't really change their CPI forecast. This is important to us as a city and as the city council uh, estimating growth in sales tax revenues because we believe there's been an increase in revenue received this year. We believe there'll be an increase next year just due to economic activity. And, but we wanna make sure that those are within line for what the state is expecting. And these are professional economists for whom this is their career. This is, this is what they do as a profession. We don't have a full-time person on staff at Lakewood to help us with those things. But in addition to these, these exterior or external um, economic forecasts, we know a lot about our own city and we know what's happening within our borders and uh, how can you miss things like this. Uh, this is the Marriott Corporation um, is building the Springfield Suites and this is very close to Colorado Mills, which is very exciting. We're gonna have lodgers uh, visiting the site, shopping at Colorado Mills, buying dinner and lunch, and hopefully breakfast and going to the movies and doing all kinds of economic activity. It's just a, it's just a great upward spiral uh, that hopefully will happen there very soon. Also, the Marriott Corporation is building the Fairfield Inn in the city. And between those two, uh, it, it's a great indicator for me that a very large international sophisticated corporation is choosing to invest $20 million in the Lakewood community because they think they can make money, first of all, and they think that, I believe, because this is a safe community with a quality living environment. And that, that really is uh, an indicator that can give us confidence uh, in forecasting an increase in revenue. And I'll give you a few more examples. These are the Alameda shops at uh, Belmar, and you should know that Belmar's primary investor is the Starwood Corporation, another very large international and sophisticated uh, company. But we also have smaller proprietors. This is 5800 West Colfax and the Bucky's Car Wash. So there's a little before and after. We also have action in the community happening in the education sector. This is uh, Colorado Academy and obviously a major uh, vertical investment that they're making. Um, and also in education, this is the Colorado Christian University's Rockmont Hall uh, dormitory residences, and this is a multi-million dollar project. You can't miss this right across the street from City Hall. And uh, of course, I always love to have the bulldozers present in my presentation. It just really, it just gives me a lot of confidence that uh, uh, things are advancing in the community. Here's an update, Council and Mayor. Uh, we met a month ago, and since then, we've collected another month's worth of sales tax. And I'm pleased to show you that now the Colorado Mills uh, is collecting sales tax and remitting that to City Hall in an amount greater than during last year's hailstorm. So that's a, that's a nice uptick, as you can see. Uh, we're still behind the 2016 activities, and, and the H&M is not yet open. Uh, we're hearing that that could open, hopefully, before the uh, holiday spending time, which is the Black Friday at the end of November, and hopefully that will drive a lot of economic activity. Uh, we're planning for that. But not yet open are the Nike store and Forever 21. Those are very important retailers, very important retailers at the Colorado Mills. So that sort of gives you a little flavor for what's going on and what we're looking at from an income standpoint. And as I mentioned, this is the thing we cannot control. So we've got to really focus on it and do a good job. And I wanna tell you, I very rarely do I use very precise numbers like this, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it. And uh, don't take my word for it. You can go out on the city's financial audit on lakewood.org in the comprehensive annual financial report. And you'll see on page 51, that last year the budget for revenue was $112,946,925. That's a big number, it's a big general fund. The actual receipts were different from that by just 50,116. That's a difference of 0.044%. 
That's a very, we'll never be that close again. I can guarantee you that. Uh, but we do a good job. We take that very seriously because we know how important it is to estimate the revenues very, very carefully. That was more difficult during the Great Recession, but uh, we certainly learned from that, and that was very, very helpful. Speaking of recessions, it's time for me to transition sort of to the expenditure side of things and spending. This is what the city can control. This is what the city council can control and management can control. As you know, we are a services organization. We have 900 full-time workers. Uh, you're aware of our police staff, public works, and community resources, plus the overhead, uh, people who provide so uh, support for those on the front line providing services to the community. Interestingly, probably about half of the services and supplies or more than that in the general fund are resources used to provide tools, equipment, all the all manner of supplies to our personnel. A great example of that is just something council approved in the budget recently. Uh, it was actually last year and that was mobile phones for all of our police agents, smartphones, I should say. We had mobile phones before, but they were the flip phones, you know. Now we've got smartphones uh, with our police agents, and that's a service and a supply, obviously, that's used by the police force. So that gives you kind of an example of uh, how the city is spending its money. And now tonight, I'm not going to invite my colleagues up to, to talk about uh, spending initiatives in the, in the departments, but I'm going to try to overview that here at a very high level. Chief McCaskey outlined proposed uh, in the police department budget two police agents. Uh, to, to add to our police force, and that'll bring the number to over 20 uh, in the last three budgets. And one of those agents will join the community action team, and the other police agent will join the traffic team. Uh, we've also budgeted money for equipment for those police agents. Uh, he, he ran through some of the, the needs. Obviously, there are bulletproof vests and taser guns and things like that that all of our uh, new police agents require in order to do their jobs. And then also Chief McCaskey proposed four additional community service officers. And community service officers, uh, they don't carry a firearm. They, they aren't a sworn personnel. Uh, but they do a lot to um, alleviate the need uh, for police agents to respond to calls. For example, uh, to minor criminal events uh, or accidents. Um, and also these community service officers are, are available for parking enforcement. So this allows the police agents to focus on the more dangerous uh, activities uh, or more immediate needs uh, happening in the community. And then in addition, uh, we need two new vehicles uh, to support those community service officers. So all of that uh, is uh, new to the police department um, and what's happening uh, as proposed by Chief McCaskey that's uh, put into the budget. Related to that, we've added police agents over the last couple of years and we've added vehicles to the city's fleet. Uh, so the only other new position, I just want to repeat that, the only other new position in this budget other than those uh, six in public safety, the only other one was a fleet mechanic uh, because we just, we're adding police agents and CSOs. We have a greater need in our fleet. Uh, we were already doing a lot uh, with as few people as possible, but we've we've reached that tipping point. So that was the only other uh, position uh, proposed in the in the budget. Now in public works, I, I have I do have a couple. Of, I do have one slide actually about some new intersection um, improvements that are coming, and I'll show you those in a moment. Um, I also have some slides uh, on our community resources department. Things happening really in uh, parks, uh, in our with our fitness equipment, and related to our facilities. Uh, I did describe uh, our things happening in our information technology department, and really the focus is on equipment and systems, and uh, really uh, replacements and updates. For example, uh, the city's enterprise resource program that is used to manage all of our human resources, uh, make our payroll, and manage all of our general ledger and accounting functions is a software package called JD Edwards. And as you know, uh, every now and then on your smartphone, you kind of update a Google app or you update an Apple or Android application on your phone and it's free. It downloads and you just keep going. You've got the latest and greatest. 
But this is a major multi-million dollar software package, and the update isn't free. It's a couple hundred thousand dollars and takes a lot of a lot of project management and a lot of implementation services and internal work from our own staffs uh, in more than one department. Uh, so that, that system will be updated and on the most current platform, which we just need to do to get our business done. And then in addition, our information technology department will be replacing mobile radios in our non-emergency uh, workforce, meaning we have um, a few hundred radios um, if I have that number right, I think it might be a few hundred thousand dollars in spending, but in mobile radios in our, for example, in our snow plows, um, in our, park, in our uh, park maintenance vehicles and so forth, so that uh, those individuals can communicate with their uh, supervision and get work done efficiently. Uh, then in our municipal courts, uh, we have uh, some mandates. I think many people are aware of going on as to what um, people who are arrested and accused of crimes have an opportunity uh, for immediate attention. That's been gotten much coverage. Uh, it's a state mandate that the city has to comply with. We're also updating some systems. Today we're doing subpoenas in a very manual fashion, both in paper and spreadsheets and so forth. We're going to start doing subpoenas uh, in an electronic manner for the first time ever, which is, uh, will make them very, very productive. Uh, we also uh, are seeing a need in our courts for a greater need for translator and interpreter services. There are, there are more languages being spoken, and some of them, uh, the interpreters are, are rare and, and few and far between. Uh, and then also we're going to do some equipment as proposed for our court marshals who keep us all safe uh, in our municipal court. Last but not least, uh, we have here for our human resources, uh, again, uh, retention through competitive compensation. We are a performance-based compensation city, uh, and in order for us to maintain that workforce that provides the services to the community, we need to remain, we need to remain competitive. And so that's budgeted for as well. I'll go into, in a moment, some of the things happening in community resources and public works, but I want to take a, just a quick second for anybody who might look at the paper copy of the budget or online, and that is we have a, a very uh, intense and detailed presentation of the Capital Improvement and Preservation Plan. It's uh, over 40 pages of projects and infrastructure management and maintenance that's described fairly, fairly thoroughly, we hope, and uh, we'll give folks an idea of coming projects, maintenance initiatives, and so forth. It's on page 423 of the budget, and I think it really outlines some of the year-to-year -year project spending. And I'll give you a little flavor for a couple of those happening in those two departments. But before I leave that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about city reserves. When revenues are greater than expenses, reserves increase. Reserves can be used either for operating or for capital projects. And in 2015, uh, the City Council gave direction to staff to uh, make some strategic investments, and those are, we've done those. Over $12 million in capital projects. It's a very long list. So many of them are still in progress. Uh, many of them are complete. Uh, but this was a very strategic decision. And uh, you'll see here that just last year, $5.9 million in reserves were used for a number of projects. And those were outlined by our public works and community resources uh, directors at our budget study session. You can go back and look at that. Some of them being park path replacements, uh, the amphitheater in Belmar Park, and, and other things. But you should know that in 2017, had no reserves been used for those purposes, that the city had an operating surplus still of $211,000. Um, and so we're putting all of those tax dollars to work each year for services for the community, not uh, building up reserves as it was. But it's also time to have a measurement, uh, really, as to how Lakewood is doing compared to our neighbors. Now, Council, last time I presented this, the city of Wheat Ridge did not have its financial audit done in September uh, for 2017, and nor did Centennial, but they're both done now. And you can see that I've got those listed there. They're quite, they're quite strong, obviously. They're very near the top there. And you can see where Lakewood falls uh, on the scale. And so uh, this is all just factual. Um, background and data, the percents are used rather than dollars because it's all relative. So for example, Denver is quite large, 
uh, obviously, uh, and one would expect that they would have substantially more reserves. Their general fund is nearly, well, it's in the billion dollar territory. Um, so naturally they would have a larger amount of cash in reserves, but as, as a percentage, um, that may be the same or less than Lakewood. So it's time to have a look at that and you see where it is. So I've got some neighbors on here for sure. Um, I've also put Jefferson County, obviously, because that's uh, very near and dear as well. And so that gives you a little flavor for where things are. So I think this slide should tell you that the mission has been accomplished, really, and that uh, the city no longer has uh, what anyone, I think, would argue is a large reserve. It is, it is $30 million as of 12-31-2017. Uh, but as a percentage, uh, you know, while Golden is a lot smaller, their reserve is smaller, their percentage of uh, reserves is higher. So I just want to provide some background on that. So in our public works department, our uh, director, uh, Jay Hutchison, outlined the need for changes in traffic signals. And you'll see that I said changes and upgrades because uh, these two intersections already have signal lights present, but rather there will be um, uh, uh, the Public Works Department will be addressing the signal lights and lighting and visibility, and it's believed that that will improve safety and the flow of traffic uh, at this intersection. I should say at these intersections, plural. Community Resources Director Kit Newland gave an overview of some things happening in CR, and first was a presentation on the Taylor property. This, this acquisition happened a little bit earlier this year uh, with a supplemental appropriation of City Council, and first, there will be community outreach related to this property, and uh, some park development will occur, perhaps the cre creation of uh, some park trails and, and so forth at the Taylor property. Also, Director Newland outlined a change coming in neighborhood parks. First, the Metal Arc Cottages, which will become uh, a neighborhood park, um, and then also uh, 20th Street and Quail Street. And there was a discussion about uh, a, a lease that's occurring that is already, uh, uh, this, this land will remain owned by another party in an agreement that is in place. Also, Director Newland outlined a program happening related to fitness equipment. The city has aging fitness equipment. It's very popular, uh, and it's time to begin a program um, that will, uh, on a pay-as-you-go type basis, begin to replace uh, some of that fitness equipment. There are a lot of expectations in the community as, as fitness equipment continues to evolve and become more and more sophisticated. And uh, my note uh, lets me know that uh, Director Newland mentioned that this would uh, generally begin at Green Mountain Recreation Center where perhaps uh, the greatest need is. And then lastly from our Community Resources Department, Director Newland outlined uh, a replacement of the Carboni Recreation Gym floor. And this is a little example on the left of some of the things happening there. And if you visit it, it's worn out. It's time for a change. And so, again, on a pay-as-you-go basis from our capital plan, uh, the Carmody Rec Center Gym floor will be replaced. So with that, I just want to go through some compliance items, Mayor and Council, and then um, announce a date and just address the one question, and then I'll be finished. We'll be ready for the public hearing. First, we do have budget requirements uh, of the city, first at the state level, uh, and then also in our city charter. The only thing left, we, we've done the city manager presenting the budget, we've, we've done this beginning uh, funds, and uh, of course we have a Tabor reserve that's already in place, and this budget will preserve that. Uh, but then last but not least, it's up to the city council to adopt a budget uh, by November 1st, and we've already got that scheduled. So we're in compliance with all the legal requirements. Um, we have met uh, for the 2018 budget, and we believe we will for 2019. All the criteria set forth for the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, we've won that, earned that as a city for 19 straight years. And uh, what this again says, not that your decisions are good, bad, or otherwise, but rather your communication uh, is very good and that the public and the city's creditors should understand the direction, the focus, and the strategy of the city. I want to give a thanks before I talk about core values to all the people who make that possible. I'm the one up here talking, but there are the leadership team, division managers, budget coordinators, and of course our budget accountant, Carrie Murky, who help us get this done. Uh, it really takes a team to do that, and I really want to recognize all those hardworking people who contribute to that. 
I don't have all of the answers, believe me. Um, but um, I just want to be the person who can give thanks to all the work that goes in. Core values. It's worth mentioning because at the front of the budget book, we talk a lot about the city council's core community values and what's important. And everything that we do as a city should be either directly or indirectly related to these core values. And uh, we keep that top of mind from the planning session all the way through to today. And even after the budget's adopted, we'll be focused on that until the next time. So it bears repeating in having those up there. So just as a reminder, we do have the second public hearing coming up on October 22nd. And Mayor, that will be a joint meeting of the Lakewood Reinvestment Authority, the city's urban renewal authority, and the city, uh, because you will be sitting as the LRA's commissioners and I will have a resolution for you to consider to adopt the budget of the Lakewood Reinvestment Authority on the same night. And um, you'll be able to get both of those done at the same time. So with that, I just had one question. Uh, at, the, at the study session, naturally, I had many more questions, and I spent quite a lot of time uh, for the public's benefit and for yours to sort of recount those questions. Uh, but the question I have is related, that I received, rather. It's not my question, I beg your pardon. The question I received is related to resolution 2018-39, and I know that you have many resolutions. That was the one related to um, contribution to the Jefferson Action Center uh, and um, for $83,000. And the question is, um, will the city manager's office uh, have funds available through vacancy or other savings in order to accomplish the payment this year uh, to the Jeffco Action, Cent Action Center? And so I did a little bit of analysis and um, um, with Kerry uh, in order to see what kind of funding we had available. And just to, for you to recall, uh, you might remember that uh, we had a change in business specialist in the city manager's office. That's now been filled uh, by a person who has moved from our information technology department over to the city manager's office. But that was vacant for about four months. We have a savings there. Also, you know, it just takes time to recruit executives. And while we budgeted and intended, intended to have our deputy city manager, uh, Mr. Ben Goldstein, uh, on staff on January 1st, he, he started at the end of February just because it, you know, it takes time to find the right people and get transitions done. So uh, that position, deputy city manager, was vacant for a couple of months. And then also, I, I, even, I went another layer down and looked at travel and uh, training expenditures and also uh, the furniture budget uh, that is within the uh, city manager's office for replacement. And all of those rolled together. Um, we're estimating a $96,000 uh, savings. I am estimating that. And uh, so that would appear to me to be more than enough to cover the $83,000 proposed in 2018-39. Um, and that was the only question that I got, Mr. Mayor and members of city council. So with that, I think it's now a time for uh, the public to have an opportunity to speak on the budget and uh, I'll be available for questions, answers and discussion right after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation for round two. And so I will now open the public hearing on um, ordinance 2018-19. And I'll start with uh, Ms. Wolfram. This is your your spot. And then we'll go to Emily Post, Carrie Sonnenborn, Lauren Price, Elizabeth, Ron, Jen, Laurent, and Diane Duffy. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I want to thank you for a couple of things. It was interesting to hear this presentation. I want to thank you for all the time and the care, the stewardship that goes into keeping Lakewood great. I also want to thank you for not kicking me out of council chambers when I came up at the wrong time. Um, so I would, um, when you write these speeches, you kind of want to get a hook or a, or a good beginning. Um, I'm coming to talk to you tonight about um, one item that does not seem to be in our budget, and that is keeping up with the sustainability plan that was created um, in the last couple of years. And in deciding what to begin with, I couldn't find anything better than the words of my 13-year-old daughter who uh, read the report that was released last night by the UN. And after she read that report, she became very frightened. And in talking to her as I drove her home from school today, she was telling me that she was jealous of me because I was able to go to 
to college and and begin my life as an adult and and begin a family in a world where, in her words, was not ravaged by terrible (laughs) effects of climate change. And she's quite worried, thanks to this report, that she is not going to be able to have those opportunities. Um, (coughs) Some of you may have known that the UN did release that report last night, and it does have very dire Uh, warnings for us that by 2040 we could be facing great wildfires, great food shortages, and other things. However, I would like to um, add that that report added a lot of optimism, and that optimism was that we still do have time and we still do have the resources to stop those terrible effects from happening. And I would, I'm a runner, I've run a few marathons, and I found that um, running lends itself to lots of uh, metaphors that are applicable to life. And so I'd like to just use that right now. Um, I would just remind Council that in 2015, a lot of work went into making that sustainability plan. There were 87 members, and there were about 450 hours that went into making that plan. That's huge. And that plan had some great goals. 45% of municipal energy, uh, residential energy, and commercial and industrial energy would, would come from the use of renewable sources. And also a goal of that um, plan was to reduce citywide building use um, um, energy use by 20 by 20 percent and of course those are great goals and I'm sure you made those with great hope and and great thought that um, you would be able to follow through with that that's how we begin a marathon we just hope for the best on that one and now we're kind of at seven mile 17 of a marathon where you're kind of like wondering where, well, you kind of like would rather be doing anything else at that point. This gentleman outlined a lot of great priorities um, that are in the budget, but I would um, suggest that it is imperative that we do keep that sustainability um, thing up. And so I'm hoping that that is included in the budget. Um, and I would also suggest that at the 20 times mile, up. you figure out what it is. And I just hope that everybody all the sustainability part is kept up. Thank you very Thank much. You. Emily, then Carrie, then Lauren. Good evening. Welcome. Hi, my name is Emily Post. I live in Ward 4. And um, I want to talk about the um, sustainability budget um, as well. Um, so sustainability is really important to me. Um, I have a family of five. There's me and my husband, and we have three kids. And over the past two and a half years, we've been able to reduce our trash um, to one 13-gallon trash bag every six to eight weeks. So we create pretty little trash. um, And we recycle, obviously. If I'm doing that, I obviously recycle too. But And we compost as well. So sustainability is really important to me. And I really think that um, the city needs to support that. We have this great sustainability plan. And and we need to make sure that we're putting our money um, where our mouth is and keep supporting that program. So thank you. Thank you. Carrie and Lauren. Good evening. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mayor Paul and uh, City Council members. My name is uh, Dr. Carrie Sonneborn. I'm a resident of Ward 1. And I have been involved with the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program pretty much since its inception, which you probably know that by now. Um, but as you may know, and that, well, as you've just been told, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has just issued the, this very dire report saying that urgent and unprecedented action is needed in order to prevent the most serious consequences of climate change. We have just 12 years to combat climate change, basically, it boils down to. The world's leading climate scientists have warned that there's only um, those dozen years for global warming to be kept to a maximum of one and a half degrees centigrade, beyond which even half a degree will significantly worsen the risk of droughts, floods, extreme heat, and of course poverty that will result for hundreds of millions of people. So we all need to do our part. Um, And as you also know, obviously Lakewood passed um, that award-winning nonpartisan sustainability plan just a few years ago, but we are actually falling quite behind on our goals that would help reduce greenhouse gases. And uh, one of those goals, generate 45% of municipal energy from renewables. We are not on track 
generate 45% of residential energy from renewable sources, not on track, generate 45% of commercial and industrial energy from renewable sources, not on track, and reduce citywide building energy use by 20%, not on track. Um, so, um, in order to catch up on our energy reduction goals and, ad and address climate change, um, I'm hoping that the city can invest in our sustainable future now. It's never too late. Um, a clean energy, well, in a dozen years it may be too late. A clean energy expert in the planning department sustainability division is urgently needed and we unfortunately don't see that in the current budget. Um, that individual could do things like implement and advise on green building, energy efficiency, and renewables in new construction in the city, could help residents uh, take advantage of energy efficiency and renewable energy in existing buildings, coordinate the energy efficiency of municipal buildings, and transition to the city's buildings to renewable energy. So um, basically, I'm calling specifically on the city to dedicate funds in the current budget to the sustainability plan, and in particular, to a staff member who would carry out clean energy and energy efficiency initiatives on all levels in our great city. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren? And then Elizabeth, then Ron, Jen, Laurent, and Diane. Good evening. Welcome. Um, my name is Lauren Price, and I recently moved to Lakewood for a job from Chicago for a job. Can you pull the microphone? Agency. There we go. I am currently finishing up my master's degree in land management and conservation through the Plant Biology and Conservation Program at Northwestern University. This includes research studying the impact of climate change and other disturbances to native Colorado plant species. I am very passionate about responsible land management so that future generations can experience the same high quality of life that we are so lucky to have here today in Lakewood. I was pleased to discover that the city of Lakewood has a sustainability plan which identifies key areas where improvements can be made to reduce energy use and decrease greenhouse gas emissions. These actions are important to ensure a high quality of life for residents now and in the future. It is important for every city to have such a plan and by having already taken that first step, the city of Lakewood is setting a good example to other cities. I'm here today to encourage the city council to allocate as many funds as possible towards achieving the goals outlined in the Lakewood Sustainability Plan. This means hiring specialists that can focus their efforts on, on meeting sustainability goals, directing money towards sustainable energy initiatives, and implementing transportation alternatives that allow residents to contribute to lowering greenhouse gas emissions by offering more transportation uh, choices. The most important lesson I have learned throughout my studies of biology and ecology is the interconnected interconnectedness of Earth's processes. These biotic and abiotic processes do not follow borders created by human society. Our actions within any delineated boundary do not just affect us, they affect other cities, other states, and other countries. Just as the actions of those other cities, states, and countries affect us. By aggressively implementing the sustainability plan to meet the goals set in 2015, the city of Lakewood will be taking positive action to improve and sustain a high quality of life for Lakewood's residents, as well as its neighbors. By taking positive action, the city can inspire change in other places, helping people elsewhere take positive actions for themselves and their neighbors in turn. Given that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with a new dire report detailing the state of Earth's climate that is desperately urging the world's governments to reduce greenhouse gases by 40 to 50 percent by 2030, we need to take action now to combat future negative consequences and to encourage other cities to take action as well. Thank you so much for listening to my comments. Thank you. Welcome to Lakewood. Elizabeth, no bad words tonight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Paul and city councilors. I'm Elizabeth Molina and I'm a resident of Ward 1. And um, I'm also an active member of Sustainable Iber and Clean Energy Lakewood. And tonight I want to take the opportunity to comment on the budget for 2019, particularly the sustainability budget that falls under planning. 
And at the uh, August 27th City Council meeting, I commented that Lakewood is not on track in meeting its sustainability goals and that it's an increase, uh, that uh, an increase in budget is necessary to make more progress. And uh, I'm going to argue uh, almost the same thing, hopefully without tripping over my own words and trigger any sensor warnings. Um, our sustainability department is small, especially compared to our neighboring cities comparable in size. The city of Boulder has about 20 FTEs working on sustainability and Fort Collins has over 38 FTEs working on sustainability. And the rather modest sustainability budget for 2019 does not aid Lakewood in reaching its sustainability goals. If Lakewood wants to make more progress, it needs to increase its sustainability budget. I want to ask the council to consider increasing the sustainability budget to be able to add one person to the sustainability team, particularly to work on energy. On a budget of approximately 200 million, this is a small expense <laughs> and a minor change in the overall uh, budget. If we look at what the current small three FTE sustainability department all has accomplished in the last few years, one can imagine that such a small increase in budget can actually make a significant difference in reaching the sustainability goals. Also, looking at the department's track record, one would realize that such an increase in budget will be highly productive. Thank you. Thank you. Ron? Greetings, Mayor Paul and Councillors. My name is Ron Horseman. I live in Ward 5. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight on this very important topic. Um, tonight, I want to comment on allocating the necessary resources to meet the goals in the sustainability plan. The Lakewood Sustainability Plan that was adopted in 2015 had goals that are good for all of Lakewood. However, I'm not aware of any other Lakewood adopted goals where progress toward meeting those goals is so deficient. In 2015, the sustainability plan goals were considered ambitious and aggressive, but a lot has changed since 2015. Over 80 cities in the United States have committed to 100% renewable energy. Six of them have already reached that goal. The question then comes up are, how did they do it? And what are the benefits? In answer to the first question, how did they do it? The answers vary from city to city. They all allocated the necessary resources to get the job done. If Lakewood is serious about meeting its sustainability plan goals, more resources will need to be allocated. In answer to the second question, what are the benefits? Let's look at Georgetown, Texas, a population of 67,000 as a case study. Here are some of the benefits. Number one, electric rates dropped from 11.4 cents per kilowatt hour to 8.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Number two, New businesses went, want to locate in Georgetown because of its low electric rates. Three, businesses can brand their products as renewable energy produced, which gives them an edge over the competition. Four, the news about clean power has reached approximately two million people. Try getting that kind of publicity with a natural gas, coal, or nuclear contract. Five, renewable energy saves water too. Six, a direct bottom line advantage, planners recognize the operational value of locally sourced energy. Add that to the competitive price and you have an unbeatable combo. Seven, locally produced power eliminates state and federal transmission regulations. Eight, locally produced power eliminates transmission costs. So the city has initiated yet another bold step. They will pay property owners for allowing them to put solar panels on their roof. Several options for helping Lakewood achieve its sustainability plan goals have been presented in previous meetings. In this meeting to finalize the budget, I stress the importance of Lakewood taking action now. It's time to allocate the resources necessary to step up the progress being made so the sustainability goals can be achieved by 2025. One or two additional staff are a minimum necessity to be a coherent with our approved city goals. A first person dedicated to the lagging goals and complex topic of clean energy is a critical need. Thank you for the opportunity to come. Thank you. Jen, Laurent, and then Diane. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jennifer Tewin. I'm a proud Lakewood resident in Ward 1. 
And I'm also here requesting that the city adjust the proposed 2019 budget to include resources to hire a clean energy expert for Lakewood's sustainability division. With the support of the current sustainability division staff, the city has seen a number of successes in the area of sustainability. And I'd like to name just a few of these successes. We have a national award-winning sustainable neighborhood program, currently eight neighborhoods. And this is just my guess. Um, assuming each neighborhood has one event per month, that's 96 opportunities a year at the neighborhood level engaging citizens that promote the city's sustainability goals. These are volunteers that organize these events. The annual sustainability awards for the past 10 years have been held honoring elementary age students, local businesses, and dedicated volunteers that have been recognized for positive contributions around making our city more sustainable. Again, these are volunteers. We've had zero waste events, Earth Day, Cider Days, and now the Italian Festival. Citizens volunteer to host the waste stations to ensure everyone knows how to properly dispose of their garbage. Again, these are volunteers. We also have a number of Lakewood citizens working with the city to provide research and feedback in the area of renewable energy. Again, these are volunteers. We have countless volunteer hours by Lakewood citizens. It's wonderful and inspiring to see so many working together toward the greater good of our city. But there is a drawback. All of these volunteers have a limited amount of time. We all have, many of us have full-time jobs, we have children to care for, and we have other volunteer commitments. The truth is, we deserve dedicated funds to add staff to the sustainability division, specifically a clean energy expert. Unfortunately, renewable energy is not an issue of if we have to move, move towards it, but when, and the time is now. There is a cost of doing nothing, and it is far more than the cost of adding staff. The cost of doing nothing can and should be avoided. We've all benefited from the efforts and dedication of those who have gone before us. We stand on shoulders of giants, leaders, positive influencers of past. This is our time. Right now, we are the shoulders of the giants in which the future generations will stand. And we have a responsibility to set a firm foundation. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Paul and Honorable Council. I'm Lauren Mayon, Lakewood resident of Ward 1. Renewable energy and energy efficiency offer so many benefits, it's hard to grasp the complete picture. Uh, here's the Colorado Clean Job Reports, 2015 full report, and 2018. I will leave these with the city financial uh, office. And uh, what they show is that Jeffco is a top tier leader in clean, in, uh, clean jobs growth. 6,242 uh, 6, of our people employed in this field in our county and growing. Here are the five fastest growing well paid green jobs. My daughter Stella, a junior at Lakewood High, whose uh, little inventions will be sent in space by NASA twice this year, wants to become an environmental engineer, the first job on this list. Here's a global economic analysis from the International Renewable Energy Agency analyzing the economics of doubling renewable energy deployments, increased GDP by $1.3 trillion worldwide, 24 million jobs. To quote the report, improvements in human well-being and welfare would go far beyond gains in GDP. Excel now recognizes that renewable electricity is cheaper than its traditional stuff. Making our solar energy locally keeps Lakewoodians money in the local economy. Energy efficiency savings keep money in Lakewoodians' pockets. For people struggling to make ants meet, this is a giant benefit, helping Lakewood be an inclusive community. For all of us, it means more disposable income, more purchases in local businesses, Clean energy savings recycle multiple time in Lakewood's local economy and businesses. 
In addition to these savings, Lakewood will leverage existing federal tax credits and state-mandated Excel rebates, drawing more money into our local economy. These combined facets yield an unmatched economic multiplier on our clean energy investments. Our small sustainability staff of three people has also proven track record of producing high results with its tiny budget. Yet the team cannot achieve our city's goals with its current means. We're lagging far behind on implementing them. Our sustainability team is less than one-tenth the size of the teams in other Colorado towns with, of similar size and goals, like Fort Collins and Boulder. So governing is to make choices. It's hard, especially around budget time. Yet there is no other choice where you can achieve a stronger return on investment for our community. No better way to invest in our children's health and local jobs. Please require a small immediate budget adjustments tonight to better align with our city goals. The strict minimum is to create this new position, the first position focused on achieving our clean energy goals. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, you're up. Okay. All right, that exhausts the folks that wanted to speak. I'll close public comment. I'll ask uh, Mayor Pro Tem to please read this into the record. Mayor, I move to accept Ordinance O 2018-19 on first reading and order the ordinance to be published in the Denver Post with second public hearing set for October 22nd, 2018. Is there a second? I second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Now we'll go into council questions and comments. Um, I will start with uh, first thanking our sustainability folks. And um, what I have to say is probably not going to be that popular. But the city body acts as a body. So, you know, a majority gives direction to our city manager. We start that process in February at our retreat. And in that process, we give the directions as to where we should go with the budget, you know, setting those priorities, and that starts the budget process. So what's challenging is when we come to the first reading to look at, well, we should include or we should add a full-time person for this or for that. Keep in mind throughout the whole year and throughout the whole process, throughout every department, those requests have been asked for and potentially denied. And those requests could be a police officer, um, a park ranger, all kinds of different positions. That is our city manager as the CEO. That is her, her job to weigh the needs. We did hear tonight that we've had great response from the mighty team that we have. We do have three full. We have an alternative planning person. We've invested over $2 million in some of our efficiency goals. And as a support of our sustainability plan and programs, you're right, it's not enough. But where I struggle with is one, we need to have a better understanding and a better cohesion from council that this is our goal. And two, to say on the night with two weeks left, what that person looks like, what their role will be. I'm just afraid that we may be doing more harm than good without going back and saying, there's a concerted goal by the city council to have somebody to see what we can do to better enhance our goals. It may not be a full-time person. It may be an allocation of dollars elsewhere or better um, uh, cohesion amongst the different departments. So I think it's important for us as a council to say, if we're falling short on our sustainability goals, and keep in mind, we have a comprehensive plan that we're always trying to push forward. We have a sidewalk plan that we're $100 million short on. We have stormwater utility that we're $150 million short on. So we have a lot of these different needs. And if you go down the dais, people are going to have a lot of different priorities, whether it's public safety or sustainability. So my ask is this, that we continue to have this conversation, but try to figure out more of what that looks like to really meet measurable goals and then to have a push at our retreat to say this is a top priority to our city manager to say this is the route that we should go. 
that's my two cents. And again, I, I thank you all very much. I believe exactly in, in what you're trying to do and the needs that we have. I'm just concerned because I think the last thing we want to do is be in a, uh, a position tonight where we're picking positions in the city budget that's really not our job, right? That's the city manager's job. And she's had to weigh all of those asks and say, this is what we can do. And, and I can guarantee you there have been um, a lot of folks turned down for full-time positions. So that's what I have. Councilor Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. Um, first, I certainly wanted to thank everybody for coming out and sharing your passion. Um, I did want to give a specific shout out. I think she might have left, but to Emily Post, she is an inspiration um, on my journey, living a more sustainable life for me and my family. Um, I agree with Mayor Paul. I think it's important for, um, you know, to kind of take a look, step back and say, okay, we know where we're falling short. Um, how do we want to proceed with meeting that? Um, as a project manager, we'd want to look at things like alternative analysis. Uh, like Mayor Paul said, maybe it's not a full-time employee. It could be a half-time. It could be a short-term consultancy that gives you that, that leaves you with six or seven or eight uh, action plans on how you might want to move forward. So I think there's certainly some ways in which we can uh, better define what we want to achieve, um, what the path might look like to that, and then how we might be able to get there. So I'm very interested in this. It's a passion of mine uh, and certainly want to keep the dialogue going, but I share some of those same concerns about the, the lateness of it. Um, but certainly it's an imperative thing that I believe we move forward with. So I'm curious to hear some of the other ideas. Councilor Bita. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I just wanted to share uh, some of my observations and concerns with the budget as it is currently written and presented. Um, as I understand it in going through our budget, we are basically at being asked as a council to approve a deficit budget for 2018 to uh, a revised budget of two, for 2018, uh, a de deficit budget in the amount that we're asking to be able to draw down our reserves for 2018 would be six and a half million dollars. In addition, we are being asked to approve a budget tonight for 2019, which would also be a deficit budget, which would re uh, draw down our reserves an additional 7.3 million. Um, now, in addition to that, in 2000. Uh, 17, we drew down our reserves uh, by about $6 million. And in uh, 2016, we, withdrew, we drew down our reserves by an additional $5.9 million. So we're talking over a period of four years now that we have continually draw, drawn down our reserves from approximately $42 million to currently 30 million and then uh, if the budget is approved it will be down to about 16 million um, that gives me great concern and i think that it should also give some concern to the rest of my colleagues um, i understand that the addition the uh, drawdowns that were done for uh, 16 and 17 were intentional because of the feeling was that we were carrying a little too much in our reserves and I'm fine with that. I think that was probably a, 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 good, a good decision. But now we're sitting at 30 million. Uh, we saw the, where that puts us in terms of the other uh, municipalities here in the Denver metro area from large ones like Denver to some of the smaller ones to ones our size and it puts us at down towards the bottom at 30 million if we draw this down again like is being proposed that's going to um, put us off the chart really we won't we won't even be close I think it's going to end up being about a 12 or 13 percent uh, uh, ratio which I think totally um, takes us off the chart and to me that tells me that that's really um, not a very good area for us to be in as a city so that that really concerns me I know that when I uh, question uh, 
um, director door here uh, about a month ago when this all came up and I was told that it was actually as I understood it a lot of this would not be necessary because we would probably make up the deficit through additional savings such as um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, savings yeah attrition uh, yeah the attrition and so we would make up a lot of it for that and so that's fine and I that was great but then my my feeling is then that should be a line item in the budget that would offset this deficit and um, if that isn't sufficient if our vacancy savings isn't enough then my feeling is that we need to go back adjust the budget accordingly so that it is a balanced budget and I want to point out too and this is in there and I don't know if our council is aware of this but this city council back in let me see I think it was 2005 and this was a 2005-48 resolution which uh, actually resolved that the that this council in this city uh, pass a balanced budget every year my understanding that that resolution has never been override written it has never been changed and so that is still the uh, goal I think the stated goal of of this council uh, and and should be of our city and so I'm very concerned and I just wanted to put that out there that um, uh, I'm going to have a very difficult time uh, agreeing to vote for a def deficit budget for 2018 and 2019. And I would much prefer that you come back with some amendments to show a balanced budget. Great. Thank you, Councillor Bita. And I know that I think we've had good conversation. And I'll ask Ms. Mr. Dorr if you want to just maybe summarize for those here and, and watching. Uh, from my understanding, and, and I will go back to the balanced budget part, it's actually in our charter, I believe, right, is the requirement for a balanced budget. Thank you, Mayor, members of City Council. Let's see. Um, I have spoken to Council Member Bita offline on this a uh, couple of phone calls, and we talked about this at the budget study session, and I provided some, some background to that. Um, I believe the resolution that was mentioned requires the, council, the, the city manager to present a balanced budget and if it's not then to present some sort of alternative so that's a, a subtle yet an important difference um, the requirement in the city charter uh, describes it's I believe it's in section 12 describes what a balanced budget is and it, it does not mean revenues will exceed expenditures rather it says all available funds which means reserves plus revenues shall be greater than expenditures and as I I mentioned in my presentation, um, one of my final slides um, in the presentation, I just want to refer to that really quickly. In fact, it says uh, in my slide, beginning funds plus revenues shall exceed expenditures. So we're in compliance with that with city charter. You know, I feel like I've come full circle on this because I was in these chambers probably 10 years ago uh, when revenues did exceed expenditures. And they exceeded expenditures every single year, uh, both the budget and then when the results came in. The reason for that is that, for example, over the last 10 years, I prepared some numbers. And even through the Great Recession, the city has underspent its budget. That's a tendency of local governments. I, I don't care which city you look at in the state of Colorado, uh, but every city is going to spend less than is actually appropriated by their city council every year because the alternative is going over budget and it's impossible to spend exactly what's appropriated. So even through the Great Recession <clears throat> of last decade, uh, the average uh, underspending uh, of the city is about 5.1% or 5.3 million over 10 years each each year. Um, and as I looked at the last five years, uh, the number is even greater. Uh, the number is um, 6.7 million and the, the smallest uh, number during that period um, was 5.3 million. So each year the city is underspent. It, that's just a fact of the of the process and uh, ordinary from city to city and town to town. Um, so in that era, a decade ago, when the budget was presented with revenues exceeding expenditures, the reserves went up and up and up each year. And you saw that in my in the earlier part of my presentation. In fact, I, let me just go ahead and 
who just kind of referred to that, and you'll see the years in which I'm talking. So from 2008, you know, through 14, the budget presented had revenues on its face exceeding expenditures, and then the city underspent, you know, that three, four, five, six percent each year. And so uh, I would hear, Mr. Dorr, we keep continuing to add to the reserves. Those are taxpayer funds that should go to providing services or capital projects to the community. And so we, I heard that, we heard that as a management, and we began taking into account the idea that we probably are gonna have some amount of savings each year. And also there were needs. We you know, program expenditures and new positions based on needs in the community that council is aware of. And, and as I mentioned, we've added uh, over 20 police officers uh, during that, uh, uh, the final years of that uptick. And so it seems like we've come full circle around to that. And it's a conundrum. Uh, it's quite vexing, I admit. Uh, there's no perfect way to do it. There's no line item uh, that's a negative spending. Uh, to do uh, in the budget that would sort of fix this. The only thing to do would be to just reduce positions, you know, not approve, you know, the increases and sort of roll back the the table back to 2008. But uh, you know, we've we've added a lot of positions, and that would probably take a few years to really through attrition and vacancy of all those jobs and elimination of them to get back to sort of that 2008 era. But if that was done, we would just be on that that steady climb. So it's a, it's a real conundrum. I, I don't know what more to suggest about it other than I hope everybody sort of understands it um, and recognizes that if you look at the operating budget uh, of the city, I mentioned last year, that's how it turned out. So for 2011, reserves were spent, excuse me, 2017, funds were spent on capital projects, but the income and expenditures with the savings was a $211,000 surplus in operations. So um, while it was mentioned that this year and next year's budget would have a 6.5 and $7.3 million operating deficit, last year 6.6 .6 million was saved and, and the, the uh, year before 7.6 million. So that's kind of what we're basing that on. Um, I don't know uh, really more direction to go on it, but we can continue to take a look at it. Okay. So and and I appreciate I appreciate that and I, I appreciate Councillor Bita's uh, uh, questions and and again this might be an opportunity after you know digging in and I've been this is I've had many of these budgets and so I have a lot of faith and not to say Councillor Bita doesn't have faith but the ebb and flow and kind of the rhythms of 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 the budgeting of this type of organization and our finance manager and our city manager presenting this with a, a fair bit of certainty that we're going to, you know, get through with those types of savings because you've realized those again for a decade. So I only looked at 10 years, yeah. but we, the city has underspent its budget every single year since 1970. I can tell you that. And so then that gives you some flexibility within that underspending to, to move around and there's not a, a hard focus on one thing or another. And then again, as presented, do you have good confidence that our reserves won't be down to $16 million? Well, you know, if you look at the Great Recession of uh, 2008, 9, and 10, the savings was less, and that's a reality. Uh, the numbers are there. Uh, the numbers were savings uh, were 3 million, 3.5, and 4.0 uh, during the years 8, 9, and 2010. So the savings is less. Uh, clearly, however, uh, management is able to control those expenditures with the help of city council. In fact, in 2010, uh, in, on an operating basis, the city spent almost $2 million less than 2009. Uh, we have a selective hiring. We, you know, have the ability to delay some projects and do some things to manage those. So there are never any guarantees. Uh, I can't give you that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but I can tell you, as I look at the last 10 years of history, uh, 5.3 million is the average. That gives, I think, some confidence, hopefully to all of us, that there will be savings this year and next year. And in a very small way, I outlined some of the savings that occurred in the city manager's office. We typically will have 50 to 70 vacancies across the city. I talked a little bit about that. It's, it's one of the smallest departments of the city, but you get a little flavor for that. So uh, there will be underspending. I'm very confident of that. Uh, what amount, it's difficult to know. And then continuing to, to manage and watch our revenues coming in, you're constantly adjusting based on those revenues. So if your forecast is high and you're coming in quite low, you're going to be finding those savings or those cuts just throughout the year. 
to get to the to the balancing that we need to get to. So what I what I would suggest is again for some this is their first budgeting process. I think it's important to to get a better understanding of this and if there needs to be changes if you do not like I think the process I think a good way to to handle that is via the retreat and look at other ways or how other communities do that. Councilor Bita, you had a follow up? I do. So I must say I find it very difficult and I know I'm in a in your in your field Mr. Dorr and you're a very well recognized expert and I'm not but it's hard for me to understand how we can say uh, the problem is that we underspend every year so therefore we need to have authority for deficit uh, for additional deficit spending from our reserve to me that doesn't even make sense secondly I would also point out if we have to come and make adjustments during the year, I would much rather have to come back and say, we have extra uh, uh, revenue uh, that, that we weren't anticipating. We're having savings, not revenue, but savings in certain areas, and we need some authority to spend it on other things that the city needs, like, you know, like uh, uh, public safety or whatever. There's always needs. So I would much rather have you come back and say, can we make an adjustment mid-year to appropriate, you know, these funds that, w that, that we haven't spent? So that makes better sense to me than drawing down our reserves. The third thing I'd like to point I'd like to make is that in going through our budget and our expenditures from last year, it becomes apparent to me that those numbers are very fluid. We, we, move, we move money around a lot, and we do it almost without anticipation in the budget. For ex let me give you a couple examples to see what I'm saying. Uh, for example, Carmody, the, uh, the projects at Carmody, there were three parts of that, and they were like one and a half million bucks, I believe. Those don't even show up on the budget for 2018 in the original budget. They're not even in there. And then, but we spent it, we spent the money, and now you're coming back and saying here, towards the end of the year, we need to have an appropriation to, um, take into account this money that we spent at Carmody, which I have no problem with. But the point is, that wasn't even in the budget for 2018. So that's just one example of the, of the flexibility that the city uses. It's the same, the same thing can be said of the uh, Lasley project. There, Lasley's not in the 2018 budget, yet they were, do, they were working on Lasley when I was not working on it out in the park, but they were doing the, the, the uh, anticipation, talking to the community, lining up the, the contractors, so forth and so on, back when I was first uh, elected back in November and December. And so, yet it's not in the budget, and so now we're coming back and asking us to go ahead and, and appropriate that $1.4 million which was spent on Lasley which again, I have no problem with, but the point is that shows a, a lot of fluidity, a lot of flexibility in the way that we spend here. So that go, again goes to, in my mind, goes to saying, why do we need to, the, to, to build in a deficit here? We've got plenty of fluidity in the way we run things it is. If we get too much of that fluidity, then that to me begins to show a lack of discipline. And that's a concern for me as a councilman and, a, and as a citizen. I think there needs to be a certain amount of discipline in how we spend our money, how we anticipate it from year to year, and that we stick to that budget. Once we get too far afield from there, that is just asking for trouble. So those are my comments. Well, and I would say that's actually the inverse because the lack of fluidity, fluidity is what has caused and given the, the savings year after year. And I just want to, I, I need to be real clear about something. There, there's no money hiding or all of a sudden appearing in a budget. And that's, those are dangerous statements. So if you could, sir. So if you could explain the Lasley, the, the park, because that, that doesn't seem to, to jive. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I just have a comment on a couple of dimensions mentioned by uh, Councillor Bita. You know, the first is uh, the suggestion that if underspending isn't occurring, that management would come to council and ask for additional funding, for additional needs, for additional appropriations. Um, you know, I have a little experience with that. I recall coming to these chambers after September 11, 2001. Uh, I recall that the country was in a very immediate and deep recession and revenues were, were, were drying up. 
And uh, so management came to the city council chambers and said, we need to start spending less money immediately. Uh, this is a very scary situation. It's hard to tell when the country will begin to recover. So it's, it's done in the inverse. It's done in the inverse where spending can be reduced. Here are the ways that the city can respond to a very deep and, and emergency uh, for less, less revenues. Um, under the scenario described, um, the, the amount of money to be spent greater than revenues is just for ordinary operations. So we'd be coming back to council chambers saying, gosh, you know, we haven't had as many police resignations or as many uh, snowplow driver resignations or as many park ranger resignations as we anticipated. So in order to make payroll, uh, we just need some additional funding in order to fund ordinary operations. So it tends to be done in reverse when revenues don't materialize or whatnot. Um, so we have a lot of experience with that, done that uh, you know, more than a few times. As for capital projects, I, I do have to speak to that. I don't know where that was referenced in the book, I'd be glad to look that up and look at the details, but I do know this. Oftentimes folks look at our listing of projects and one of the challenges with projects is really timing them. We're talking about major con complicated construction that typically occurs over multiple periods. And I have to say, we're probably guilty of our own success and you know, no good deed goes unpunished on this, which is when money is appropriated for a capital project that might take, well, that will take more than one year that money is appropriated, and if you read the city charter, appropriations for capital projects do not expire. They are available for multiple years because you can't get halfway into a project and have another subsequent council say, no, you know, we don't want to reappropriate the balance of the money due. So what we do is sort of challenging, uh, but we want to do our best, and there's no perfect way to do that. And so what we do is say, hi, uh, you know, in, in 2016, for the 2017 budget, we're going to appropriate a million dollars for Lasley Park. And I'm, I'm speaking hypothetically. So we show that appropriation in the book. We show it for 2017. We hope that it will get done, but we have construction that's in the weather, we have to retain contractors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the construction doesn't necessarily get done, or maybe we don't have the project manager resources to attend to it. So funds carry over to a subsequent period. And this goes for technology, this goes for buildings and facilities. We're right in the middle of a sustainable project, as mentioned by you, Mayor, where we're uh, upgrading the sustainable features at the Carmody Recreation Center. Uh, we've borrowed funds to do that. We have many, many complicated projects that will always overlap a period. Even if a project starts on December 1st, we still have to have all of the appropriations up front in order to sign a contractor. A contractor isn't going to want to start to do the work. Uh, they're going to say, gosh, I'm looking at your budget. I see you've got $100,000 appropriated, but I'm going to do $800,000 of work in January, February, March, and April. So we put the money up front, and then in the subsequent budget, we, we adjust that, and we look at the idea that there's still X amount of dollars unspent, and we represent that for the purpose of transparency, to be able to say, hi, we still have $800,000 left to go on this million-dollar project. We reappropriate it uh, and whatnot. So I could look at probably nearly every capital project that the city is doing in its budget and nearly all of them cross a year period and therefore there's the change so but i can tell you this every single purchase 50,000 and greater is going to require the the approval of city council so there's no fluidity that would allow a million dollar project to happen or or frankly a $51,000 project to happen without the approval of the city council uh, at the end of the day thank you sir mr abel Councilor Abel, sorry. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple of things. First, I'd like to uh, encourage the folks here that want another FTE for our uh, sustainability project to uh, be persistent. Uh, we approved the budget October 22nd. October 23rd, give me a call. We'll start working on it for next year. I'd like to... Uh, let folks with other needs know that as well. If there's a concern out there that you think we should address in the budget, let us know early. Uh, we uh, will spend the next 12 months working on the details of that budget. And I would like to gently remind the mayor that uh, we're all waiting to speak and he has given himself the floor three times uh, while each of it, some of us have yet to speak. So. Let's please uh, remember that we're all on an equal footing here. 
and deserve the chance to speak. <laughs> Coming from you, that means a lot, sir. Fourth time. Fourth time. Membership has its privileges. Fifth time. Good one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, so I think that this is a really great budget um, and that it very well uh, reflects our community goals and values. Um, and uh, I know there was a lot of hard work and expertise that went into this budget. Um, and I also am a rule follower and I don't like to rock the boat. Uh, however, I think that there are some times and issues that are worth, um, times that it's worth uh, rocking the boat. And I think for me, this is one of those times um, where I know that we went through a year long process in our budget. I know that we set our council priorities. I know that um, implementing the sustainability plan did not rise to the top four of our council priorities. Um, and I know that we've already made significant progress in our sustainability plan. However, um, I think that there have been some things that have happened since we set our goals in February uh, that make this worth evaluating even late in the game. And those things are, number one, we had our uh, sustainability plan update um, in April or earlier this year. I'm not 100% sure that it was in April. Um, but the point is, is that we are falling short on our goals. We are falling short on, I think, nearly a significant number of our energy goals. I wrote down a couple of them. 45% um, municipal energy from renewables not on track, 45% residential energy from renewable sources, not on track, 45% um, commercial and industrial energy from renewable sources, not on track, citywide building energy use intensity 20 reduced by 20%, not on track. Um, I just want to point out also that when we set these goals, uh, they were developed to be achievable for Lakewood. We're not Boulder, we're not Fort Collins, we're not setting 100% renewable energy goals, but we did set a 45% reduction goal. And we made that commitment as a community. Um, and frankly, our, our community has been stepping up and investing and donating their hours, their time, their expertise to meet these goals. Um, and I think that we owe it to our community to at least discuss um, and making an additional investment at this point um, to get back on track for those goals. Um, the other thing that happened, of course, a lot of people met, brought this up, um, and I think this is kind of what pushed me over the edge of, of wanting to raise this issue, is that um, the IPCC, which is the inter governmental panel on climate change released a report. It's been all over the news. I picked a quote from a source, The Guardian. It's ranked number seven um, in trustworthiness. So it's not one of your highly politicized um, news sources. Um, the bottom line is that we have 12 years. So let's say that we just go about business as usual and we'll make our another budget proposal next year that will be a, a full year before we get to have this additional person in place um, so then we're down to 11 years uh, and you know the the clock is ticking um, and the the quote that I wanted to say is that they show that it can be done within the laws of physics and chemistry um, but the final tick box is political will. We cannot answer that. Only our audience can, and that is the governments that receive it. To me, this is saying there's documented urgency. This is not something that we can just wait and, and wait on. Um, and we are that government body that has to make the decision of are we going to step up and face what many consider one of the biggest challenges of our time or, or not? 
Um, this is a high community priority. We are not meeting our goals at our current budget and staffing levels. I, I certainly hope that everyone will make this a, a top priority, a top three priority, or at least the majority of you make this a top three priority um, during our next budget process. Um, but in the meantime, I, I hope that we can consider um, making either an amendment to our budget or within the next six months or on some early timetable um, addressing this community priority that is falling behind. Uh, we heard a lot about a community or an energy specialist tonight. Um, this is a tough one for me to talk about because staff is not my, I, I, I am not um, supposed to, or it's not my job as an elected official to determine staffing. Um, it's my job to help set policy. Um, and so to me, the policy that we should be setting right now is to get back on track. Um, my understanding is after uh, conversations, um, once finding out that we are behind on our goals, is that the best way to do that is through a, um, a energy specialist. Um, this is someone who could help our community um, take advantage of re rebates and partnerships and uh, low cost at audits and these are things that could put dollars back in our people's um, monthly budget when we're already also struggling with affordability. Um, again, I, I don't particularly feel it's appropriate for me to be laying out um, what that person would specifically do. What I do know is that energy is our, is our biggest area to make a difference. Um, it's our largest area of greenhouse gases. Um, my understanding is that that is uh, something that our staff w would help them accomplish and get us back on, on track for our goals. Um, if the body would feel more comfortable in doing a, a six month time period to figure out exactly what that is, if it, it is not that, then I think that would be great. Um, again, I just, I think that in light of the fact that we have fallen behind since our, our meeting, we have new information available to all of us that this is a timely measure, a timely issue. I'd like to consider um, looking at this as part of this budget cycle, as well as next budget cycle. Thank you. Councilor Harrison. Um, thank you. Uh, I, th I think this idea is worth exploring, um, but I'm uncomfortable just like you, Dana, about asking um, uh, t for staffing. What I would really, really be uh, probably a little bit more comfortable with is asking um, a little bit of time for uh, uh, the sustainability department to come back with us and maybe look at what they could do and how they can do it. And um, I'm feeling really dumb as to what a clean energy expert would do and how they would do it and what, and specifically, what would it cost? Could we find a consultant that might be able to do that, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm really willing to support the sustainability goals, but if I'm feeling like I don't have quite enough information to add that to the budget today, but I would definitely be willing to come back and look at it in six months if if that would be something that you'd be amenable to. Councilor Vincent? Yes, um, I don't mind doing some more investigation on this, but to say that it is the most important community need, I would be hard pressed at this point to to say that for the people that I know. There's a need for sidewalks. There's a, we've got flooding. We've got all sorts of issues. Um, so I don't mind doing a study session, but I cannot support it at this, at this time 
um, we've been working on this for a year, and I, I think that it's something that's very doable to talk about at our next retreat, or at our retreat. Thank you. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Please cast your votes. Mayor? And four. There was a motion on the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, Dana. There wasn't. There's a motion and a second to to advance this to second reading. Yes. 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 There, I seconded it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I wrote it in. I wrote yep. it in. Okay. Well, I it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. There's a motion and a second to carry this towards second reading. Please cast your votes. Mine doesn't work. <laughs> so um, let's just, I will display. I'm all locked. It won't even display. Okay. Cast your votes. There we go. All right. And it passes 10 or AI, two nays, the nays being Johnson and Beta. So. Just for the record, that moves this to the second public public hearing, which will be on October 22nd. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll have another public hearing at that time. All right. Ms. Hodson, executive report. Thank you. That came up quick, quickly. So thank you for indulging me. Um, just a couple of things this evening, um, important items. Uh, tomorrow, actually, there is uh, West Metro Housing Solutions is going to celebrate the grand opening of their new apartment community, 5800. And the address is 5800 um, West Alameda Avenue, and that's also the name of the site. Um, so that will take place on October 9th, which is tomorrow at 3 p.m. Um, we'd love to see everyone there if possible. Also, you have read this probably in, in your information, but I want to make sure the public is aware of this. We will be um, conducting various emergency management trainings. This is really important for our law enforcement folks and first responders. We will be holding mock scenario trainings with Lakewood PD, West Metro Fire, Jeffco Sheriff's Department, hopefully Wheat Ridge PD, and that's gonna happen soon in October. Their trainings will be focused on an active threat in our buildings and will help educate all the first responders and the Lakewood staff on how best to prepare. Um, so what this means is we will be closing facilities, three of our facilities, three of our recreation centers, for the bulk of the day. And here are those dates and locations. October 9th, which is tomorrow, that's Carmody Recreation Center. October 16th, um, Green Mountain Recreation Center. And then October 25th. So please refer to um, liquid.org for the times that those facilities will reopen. And it will probably be um, about, Five, 5 or 6 p.m., but that information will be on liquid.org. I wanted to give you some information that I've never shared before, and I thought this might be interesting. Many of you and many of your constituents are on nextdoor.com, right? So here's some interesting information. We've got a summary of our September usage of Nextdoor. The city um, did 22 posts. And we, across the city, we um, calculated that there were 47,885 views of those 22 posts, and that's in one month. So that is a lot of uh, exposure, 47,885 views. So that's September. And I'll, I'll let you know if that's interesting to you. I'll let you know as that um, every month if you're interested. We have also updated the dashboard for September. It's, it's great to look at. I looked at it today. And um, the way to access the dashboard is liquid.org backslash dashboard. We invite everyone to um, follow the dashboard. 
And finally, just from an informational perspective, uh, your next council meeting is a study session. Well, actually, it's interesting in that we have a workshop in the cabinet room to discuss the first draft of the campaign finance ordinance. This is next week at 5.30 in the cabinet room, um, and that's a workshop. Right after that, we will have a study session at our normal time at 7 o'clock with two interesting presentations. One is our annual Head Start report, always really interesting to see what's happening in, um, in our Head Start program, and then State of the Courts, another really interesting presentation. So I wanted you to be ready for that, and remember to be here at 5.30 sharp for the workshop. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is the consent agenda. Uh, the use of the consent agenda has been made to expedite council action. It contains both resolutions and first reading ordinances. Resolutions are items of routine nature. Members of the public will have an opportunity in a moment to comment on any of the proposed resolutions. First reading ordinances appear on the agenda only for the purpose of setting future public hearing dates and ordering the newspaper publications of the proposed ordinance. No. Public comments will be heard this evening on first reading ordinances. The public will have the opportunity to comment on the proposed ordinances during the scheduled public hearings on the dates set tonight by City Council. Any member may request an item on the consent agenda be removed for separate business and discussion under general business. Will the clerk please read the items on the consent agenda into the record? The consent agenda consists of items seven through nine inclusive. Item 7, Resolution 2018-42, supporting a grant application to Great Outdoors Colorado requesting funding for a school-based community garden at Slater Elementary School and authorizing execution of grant agreement and inter intergovernmental agreement if approved. Item 8, Ordinance 02018-20, authorizing contingent supplemental appropriations to the City of Lakewood 2018 fiscal year budget in the event ballot issue 2D is approved. And Item 9, approving the minutes of the City Council meeting of August 13, 2018. All right, thank you. I'll now open the public hearing on Resolution 2018-42. Nobody's wished to speak. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion. Mayor Paul, I move for the approval of council minutes, order all ordinances introduced on first reading to be published in the Denver Post with public hearing set for the date included in the ordinance and for adoption of resolutions, all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into the record by the city clerk. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. And that passes 10 ayes, zero nays. Will the clerk please read item 10? Item 10, Ordinance 02018-18, adding a new Section 2.02.040 to the Lakewood Municipal Code, clarifying the definition of a one-half term of office for the mayor and members of the City Council, as used in Section 2.6 Perin B of the Lakewood Home Rule Charter. Thank you. Forgive me, is there a presentation? Yes, sir. Okay. There is a brief Sorry. presentation. I lost my script. Mr. Cox. You didn't take it. I did it last week too, remember? That it's right. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Tim Cox, City Attorney. Um, once again, to talk about the uh, proposed ordinance amendment uh, to address the issue of what a half of one half of a term of office means. Uh, as used in uh, the city's code and charter. Um, we've talked about this a couple of times before. Last time was a, uh, uh, at a study session, and we got some direction from council at that time. And so we're back tonight to uh, talk about what that looks like. 
We will. Uh, this is a much abbreviated version of the presentation you saw the last time, uh, because I know we have talked about it on a couple of occasions. But for the benefit of the public, people who may not have heard of the situation before, we did want to provide a little bit of background as to why this came along when it did and uh, what the issue is and a little bit of history. So the purpose is to uh, answer the question of how to apply the term limits in uh, the city's uh, regulations. It's also in state law. But we do have term limits. Essentially, it's uh, uh, two four-year terms is the max for each member of city council. Uh, but we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, and what we're seeking through this process is approval of a legislative clarification of the language that uh, is uh, a little bit ambiguous. Uh, and the direction we got at that study session from you all was to uh, prepare an ordinance using what we called uh, the year counting method. And we'll explain that in just a moment. My apologies. Um, we, the last time we did this presentation, we worked uh, chronologically backwards uh, on the regulations. As they came about, we decided to go forward this time. So. Going back to 1983, that was the time of the uh, charter adoption uh, by Lakewood voters, um, which established the terms of office I just mentioned, uh, four-year terms and limited mayor and council to two of those four-year terms. Um, the, the note at the bottom reflects the fact that when the Constitution was amended after this time, uh, the Constitution used the same limits as Lakewood voters adopted. From 1983, we have fast forward to 1992 when voters approved amendments to that uh, charter, which included the language you see on your screen. Any person appointed or elected as the mayor or elected as a member of the city council who serves or has served at least one half of a term of office shall be considered to have served a term in that office. And we'll talk about how we get to that point. And then again to 1994 when uh, Article 18, Section 11 was added to the Colorado Constitution setting two consecutive terms in office as the limit for elected officials in any city with three terms if the terms are two years or less that obviously does not apply here um, that section of the constitution does specifically apply to home rule cities but it also provides that the voters in any political subdivision can lengthen shorten or even eliminate terms of office uh, limits on terms of office if they're so inclined so uh, with that as a little bit of history, the question that we have, going back to that 1992 amendment to the charter, when the phrase one half of a term of office was introduced uh, at the local level, what does it mean there? And we have discussed at past uh, sessions uh, the options for that. What we do know is that the Constitution does not answer that question, uh, and neither does state statute. There were two uh, advisory opinions given by state officials, one by the Secretary of State, one by the Attorney General, having to do with a state elected officials. But uh, those two officers did provide um, opinions at one point, and they are non-binding, and they don't agree with each other. Um, our charter does not answer the question what one half um, of a term means. Uh, and uh, there's one case that we've talked about at length uh, that is non-binding on the city and provides one possible answer. Let's back up just a moment to those uh, opinions from this Attorney General and Secretary of State. Again, as to a state legislative office, a couple of them actually, folks who took office to fill a vacancy before a term was completed and then finished that term, ran for another term, served a term, and uh, the question was, have they now served one term or two based on what half of a, one, one half of a term means? Confronted with those uh, situations, the Secretary of State counted the days uh, that the person served to determine, was it more than half of a four-year term? Was it more than the number of days in two years? Uh, or was it fewer than that? And concluded that the uh, individuals in that situation had served less than half a term based on the number of days that they had served versus the number of days they had not then they were therefore eligible to run for one more uh, term under the Secretary of State's opinion. The Attorney General at the time uh, used the legislative session rather than the number of days in a year, rejected the day counting method for various reasons, and uh, uh, measured it as by the legislative sessions, which is not something that we have at the City Council level. 
So there's some value in the discussion that those two uh, officials had in their opinions about the issues, but uh, neither answers the question very sat satisfactorily for us. So we looked at that case law. The one case is related to that, to those opinions. Um, the, the case went to court involving those two legisla state legislative officials. And the court was left to determine, this is in Denver, Denver District Court, to determine what that phrase means as used in the state constitution. In that case, the judge determined that there's no ambiguity, that it's clear that um, one half of a term means take the number of days and cu cut it in half and you'll know whether you're on the short side or the long side. Um, uh, comparing the results with the numbers of days since each of the senators was sworn into office. So the so-called day counting method was used in part because the judge determined there was no ambiguity to resolve. We just, we, we all uh, know how to count the days and, and figure out which side of the line you land on. Um, whether you like that result or not, it's not binding on Lakewood for the following reasons. First, because it's a district court decision and without an appeal, a district court decision is not binding on anybody but the parties. Uh, it was done in Denver, uh, not in Jefferson County. That's another reason it is not binding here. Um, it discussed term limits, but for state legislators, not local officials, a different constitutional provision. Um, and uh, the, the last note indicating that the, uh, um, it, there's some, some line placing here that uh, may or may not work when we have uh, uh, this situation without legislative sessions. But acknowledging that, as we did, that there are pros to the day counting method, that it's pretty mathematically exact if you can uh, count the days uh, down to the final one. It's the most precise use of the word half and consistent with some other uses of that word in state law. But as we discussed at our last session, there are some uh, cons to that method as well. One being that it's uncertain. It really comes down to a case-by-case -case basis. If you're going to look at when an individual is sworn into office and when they finish their service, um, someone could land on one side just based on the luck of the calendar as to when the swearing in date was versus um, another person who's similarly situated. And uh, there's some benefit to the voters in having predictability and certainty as to who's going to be uh, occupying a seat at any given time. Uh, and in that same respect, it can be seen as arbitrary because two people occupying the same type of office could end up in uh, one limited and one not limited when the days are counted. And you may not know at the beginning of the term what those days are going to add up to. The attorney general who issued that uh, advisory opinion said at the time that the, it, there's some risk of a man manipulation and uh, gamesmanship and cited an example of that. Uh, not any suggestion that uh, there's been anything like that uh, in any of the examples that have happened. Uh, not that there have been many, but um, that is a possibility, as the attorney general had said. And uh, there's some inconsistency with the purpose, which is to limit the service of, of uh, elected officials and you all knew going in that uh, you're going to serve no more than two four-year terms um, and you may feel that you're eminently qualified to go beyond that and you quite may well be um, but the law has the uh, the voters of the state have spoken and said they want to limit uh, incumbency so that there's more turnover and uh, um, allowing terms to be interpreted in different ways under different circumstances doesn't necessarily follow that, uh, that goal. So a quick recap, and then we'll show you the language uh, that's, that's uh, in the packet. The charter talks about at least one half of a term, that's in the amendments. Uh, uh, one half of a term equals a, f a full term if you've served at least one half, uh, but one half is not defined. The two state officials reached opposite conclusions. The case law doesn't give us a lot of guidance um, and so we presented at the study session and previously an alternative approach that really recognizes um, you're not elected to serve 1,460 days. You're elected to four-year terms. Um, that's, that's what the term limits law says, and that's what is the reality. You're elected to serve four years. and and uh, voters don't typically pay attention to whether you're um, elected on this date or that date if you're elected for those four years. 
And the way it's set up, because there's elections every two years, you're going to have a midterm election approximately two years in, not necessarily precisely two, two years into your four-year term. But it is the midterm election. They call them that at every level of government. So the suggestion that we presented, and that was uh, the direction given, was to recognize that if an election to fill a vacancy occurs after a midterm election, and the candidate, elect the candidate elected at that special election serves less than half a term and fulfills that time, uh, then it is less than half a term and therefore doesn't count as a term for term limits purposes. On the other hand, if the election to fill the vacancy occurs at, at that midterm election or before that midterm election, then the person elected serves at least half a term um, and is considered to have served a full term with only the opportunity for one more term to serve. And this is the way it looks in the proposed ordinance. It would be a new subsection in uh, uh, Article 2, entitled one half of a term of office. And it says what I just said. When a person is elected to fill a vacancy in the office of mayor or as a member of the city council and such election is held, either at a general election held during the term of such office here and after a midterm election or at a special election held before the midterm election and that person elected serves until the next general election, then the period of service constitutes at least one half of a term of office as referenced in the charter, regardless of the date upon which the midterm election is held or when the person begins his or her official duties. The second paragraph, uh, paragraph uh, 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 C, is uh, just the, the corollary that if a person is elected to fill a vacancy at a special election held after the midterm election and serves the rest of that term, that person is not considered to have served at least one half of a term of office and can serve two more if uh, the voters are so inclined. So that's what we did with the direction given and uh, we're happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. Now open the public hearing on ordinance 2018-18 miss gillickson you've said you do not favor the question do you not wish to speak mr healed you wish to speak come on down and then david wickman and randy no and no and then diane good evening mayor paul and uh, city council members i'm alan healed ward four um, regarding the proposal to redefine half terms, um, Councillor Abel clearly explained over a year ago uh, when this issue came up, um, and there was an attempt by you know someone on council to to block Councillor Johnson from running for re-election based on the definition or understanding of midterm uh, elections. That uh, the language in the charter, um, what what Charlie uh, Councillor Abel pointed out, and which I've followed clearly, is the language in the charter seemed to work as intended. Um, if you key off of uh, the swear-in date and you count days, it seems to work. Um, due to the way the calendar works relative to holidays, uh, the number of days actually served in a partial term may simply not be consistent year to year. I mean, this is just a, a simple mathematical reality. Um, you know, by keying off of a, a swearing-in date, the charter as is provides for the reality of mathematical variation in the length of partial terms. Uh, I don't see that as a, as a screaming out for a needed change. I think if you vote to replace current language on half term with an artificial limit, uh, you're voting to disenfranchise the voters. And what I mean by artificial limit is that if a person is elected but they're not sworn in, they can't serve in the interim between those two dates. Uh, to change the charter so the person who serves less than a math mathematical half term is counting as having served a full term seems to require a vote of the people. Now, under the current provision, we the people can decide if we want to elect a person who served a term mathematically short of a half term to two more full terms. So the limit is the people's right to choose. Um, I ask that you leave this fair and time-tested process intact. If you feel that the charter language can be clarified without changing the definition of a half term, I would always support greater clarity. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Mr. Wickman. 
appreciate you taking up this issue. When it came up uh, when I was on council, you know, the situation with Ramey turned out all right. But my concern was, what about next time? Somebody else could have been in the wrong position on day counting, and they could have been uh, deprived of their right to vote or to run. And that would be just wrong. And so I like the idea of going to the years. And we should be looking in terms of this is a two-year term that uh, Ramey was in and comparable people. And so as a result, we have three choices. If it's less than two years, we know that it's okay. It's not a term limit situation. That's fine. If they serve for more than two years, then that is basically a four-year term and they shouldn't be allowed to run again. So we're talking about today the situation where it's exactly a two-year term. Well, I feel that all the evidence that you saw s says right now that uh, the people and the um, um, all the precedent says that a two-year term should not be counted as a four-year term. And I, I would point out, if the city charter had wanted a two-year term to count as a four-year term, they wouldn't have put in this at least half in the whole bit. They would have just come out and said, a two-year term counts as a four-year term, and that's that. They didn't do that. And you saw, I think, the reason why, because it's a bad idea. But anyway, let me go back, give you a little history. I'm old enough that I remember the 1960s and the 70s when the term limit issue was a big political debate. And I remember at that time, on the one hand, the concern was people were in Congress for 30 or 40 years and we needed some turnover. But on the other hand, people pointed out there were problems. And the problems, as Alan pointed out, number one, is if you tell somebody that they can't run, you are depriving those voters of the right to make their own choice. If they agree that that person has served too long, they should go. But if you take that decision away from them, you are depriving of their constitutional rights. But also, what is the value to we the people, the city council? Experience counts. You know for yourself that first term that you've been on office here is basically a learning curve. And it's really only until you're into that second term and beyond that you're actually knowledgeable enough to make a difference. Cutting people off early is basically cutting off your nose to spite your face. The, the, there is no good reason to, cut, to deprive somebody of the right to be running for another term. So if we sit here and say that a two-year term is the same thing as a four-year term, this is counterproductive in every sense of the word. There are no advantages and nothing but disadvantages. So I would suggest we make it clear in this example, and, and I realize I think it says that a two-year term exactly is not the same thing as a four-year term, and it should not be a term limit. But if it's not clear enough, this is your opportunity to make it clear. Make it clear a two-year term is not the same thing as a four-year term. And if somebody is willing... Well, time's up, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Diane? Maybe I'm naive, but when this came up before and I saw the case law, a judge had decided what our exact language meant. Now, I agree with Mr. Cox that it is non-binding because it's Denver and we're Lakewood. But I still go back to a judge looked at the language and made a decision and came down with that decision on what that language meant. And I didn't understand, and I still don't understand, why we completely dismiss that judge's opinion on this. I totally agree it's not binding, but we, it's still relevant. And don't we use other case law in other instances to say this was ruled here and this was legislated here. I, I just don't understand why we're completely dismissing that just because it's Denver and not a Lakewood judge. I think you need to go back and look at the fact that a judge looked at the language and made a decision. I think this is unnecessary. I think you, you got it right the first time. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, I'll close, close the public comment.
and ask for a motion. I move for the adoption of Ordinance O 2018-8, second and final reading. I second. Motion is second. Councilor Abel. Uh, I still like the day counting method because it is eminently more precise. Uh, it keeps people from losing out because of the way holidays fall uh, and that sort of thing. But I also uh, think it is the correct uh, way to handle this because the voters in Ward 1 overwhelmingly demonstrated that they agreed that the uh, Ms. Johnson deserved a uh, full term because of the way the days fell. So, thank you. Councilor Johnson? Oh, my. Well, you'd know that I'd be speaking on this. First, uh, defining term limits is confusing. I believe that I am the only person in 50 years that has been intimately involved in this awkward issue of serving a half term and then running for two full terms. I believe I bring a valued and rich understanding that frankly, no one else could understand or, or has. The only exemptions to this are the two incumbent state legislators who took the issue of half terms to a court challenge, and they did win, I believe. Correct? Right. Secretary of State and Attorney General. I believe that the best interest of the people and justice for the legislator likely factored into that outcome. One item that we need to understand, council did not give staff direction for any particular draft language, Tim, the way that I remember it. So um, this is pretty specific. I'm not sure that that happened. I don't recall it that way, but you can respond. I'm sure you will. Well, just to say, not the specific language, but the as the options were presented, the day counting versus the alternative method. The alternative method is what was uh, directed. I don't recall it that way. That's how it happened. Okay. We can go back if you'd like. Since Lakewood became a city, again, I believe I'm the only one that has been affected by the half-term limits issue. We must learn from what happened one and a half years ago so that no one will experience what I've had to go through. And frankly, it cost my husband and I $10,000 to prove the point. It is appropriate we deal with, lang with any change or alteration in language when a current seated member is not affected. This never should have happened when somebody who was in place was and was running. Term limits were designed to prevent serving on city council from becoming a career. Although the efficacy of term limits can be debated, it is not really part of this discussion. Because the situation I dealt with has only happened once since Lakewood became a city 50 years ago, this is really not that common, folks. Looking at, at this now does give us a chance to really do what is in the best interest of you, the people. Remember, there is case precedent defining half terms by using the day counting method. This has been decided in court. By using the day counting method, it is mathematical and is not ambiguous. Interesting to me that the draft language for Lakewood's charter clarification didn't just follow that to begin with. Speaking of our charter, um, 
I'm st it's still unclear to me how we can make changes without this to a vote of the people, frankly. Now to the issue at hand. I firmly believe that we as a body must look at what is in the best interest of the people. If someone cannot finish a four-year term and leaves the seat vacant with two years remaining, should serving under two years count toward running against for two more full terms? A candidate who runs to fulfill a half term should not be penalized. We are looking at extending a term by two years versus someone serving six years. Adding two years to eight years, frankly, is really pretty much insignificant. At that point, you bring greater experience, institutional knowledge, and understanding how the city works and how to be an effective public servant. But allowing only six years to serve eliminates the understanding one gains dealing with issues, experience in city affairs, the flow of the information, and again, how to be effective. From someone who has been intimately involved in this position, the cost to the people is loss of institutional knowledge and an understanding of how things work. During a counselor's second term, one is finally becoming effective and knows the questions to ask and how the city runs. It takes a while to actually get to that point. Basically, you add more value for your constituents and not always in an orientation mode. We as a body should welcome when we have a mentor and see that as a benefit that is valued. Additionally, for some worthy candidates, knowing that they will only serve one full term beyond two years may eliminate a good person. Let the people decide at the ballot box if the people want someone to stay on for another four years. Give the power of term limits in this case to the people. Two years is really a modest amount of time to allow someone to continue to serve. We must err on the side of someone with more experience and better ability to enhance honest governance. Our founding principle should be ethics and virtue. Ultimately, if one has served a half a term by the day counting, then one should be allowed to serve two additional terms. Thank you. Council Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. Appreciate that. Um, I guess I wanted to just start out by saying, and, and this is in no way, it just seems like we're spending an inordinate amount of time on this issue. We have a lot of things going on in the city. It's only occurred one time. So I just want to call attention that my constituents kind of, you know, keep us honest on where we're focusing our time. And there's a lot of things they would prefer that I was up here speaking about. So that's first and foremost. Um, second, I am much more comfortable erring on the side of 10 years than I am on six, and it's because I have learned firsthand the learning curve. Um, it, I, I feel I'm pretty bright, um, and it still is a lot of information to take in. You're trying to figure out um, how to help your constituents forward in the things that they're trying to achieve. You're trying to also look at a budget that's 500 pages, and, and so all of that. So I wanted to say that I'm more comfortable um, erring on the side of, of cost and not having it be a discouragement. Um, if I was considering running and this were a half term and I knew it was a half term, I'm not sure it is a huge investment to be out there knocking on thousands of doors. So I just want to, want to say it is a huge investment. And um, also, um, when you have served, say, that six years, you have a long track record. You're 
can, your constituents can have a lot to judge you on. I think that I would prefer, in my view, to err on the side of caution and to be in the 10 years rather than the six years and letting the voters decide if they feel that that representative has not represented them well, absolutely they can either choose to run for themselves or they can find another candidate they support. Um, but again, I just am one of those folks where I can't see the We've, it's happened one time and we're spending an inordinate amount of time on this and I think we can maybe hopefully get to something fairly quickly that doesn't disenfranchise those folks who we may want to fill a term if somebody has to step away, one of us has to step away. So those are just kind of all my core thoughts and hope we can get to something real soon. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Roybal. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Johnson, and uh, Councillor Franks brought up a lot of good points, and I, uh, I echo those. However, uh, I also look at um, when you look at the day counting versus the actual date, uh, to me, I kind of look at it tomato or tomato, and we're here to make a decision of how we would like to see that. And I think we're missing the point, and the point is is that uh, we need to stay true to the charter. And my suggestion, and I have a motion here, that I would like to take this issue to the people and let them vote on it. So so before, before you make that, just legal clarification, though. Is this within the bounds of the body to codify the code, or does it need to go as a charter? And if you send it, I mean, we'll just answer that first. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that before, that um, the charter is a broad statement of, of policy for the most part and does not define a lot of details of, of processes and such. And there, the code is, is the document that really implements the charter and provides the detail, fills in the, 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 the gaps and so on. And that's what we're talking about here is we have language in the charter that was adopted through the, the vote of the people. And that language is uh, susceptible to more than one uh, interpretation. And all we're trying to do here is provide language that will answer the question before this ever happens again, if it ever happens again. Uh, this is not by comparison to a lot of things we've worked on, this has not been a time-consuming matter. We talked about it back when it first came up. It was agreed by the council to put it off until after that election. We were asked to bring it back. We did a study session on it. And now we're here tonight, half an hour or so in, 40 minutes in, uh, and with a, a fairly simple question in front of you as to whether you want to adopt this language or leave things as it is. So I don't think we've invested a lot of time, relatively speaking, um, uh, and, and the idea is that we better have this answer in place and never need it than to have this situation arise and be left wondering, is this person eligible or isn't, isn't he or she? So you're, you're, you're actually saying that we're just kind of clarifying what the charter's intent was. Well, let's ask the people themselves and that, answer's gonna, that question's gonna be answered. And, and that's so, fine, Councillor. That doesn't address Councillor Frank's concern about the amount of time we're putting into the issue. That will be a very become a lengthier and more expensive. Well, uh, we we can date. definitely put it in November. I mean, we well, can we postpone it. We can't do that this year. <laughs> well, and I would still say I. It would have to be next next November. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we can come back and visit this in a year, and put it on put it on the ballot. So the floor is yours. If you'd like to make a motion, please make a motion. I would like to make a motion to send this ordinance uh, to the vote of the people. Point of order, Mayor, we have two motions on the floor. So this would be an amendment to the motion. Thank you for that point. Thank you. I would like to make an amendment to take the, the language um, to the vote of the people. Okay. So I have a lot of lights on. If you, I have it written down. If you want to speak to the motion, please leave your light on. If not, please turn it off. Not the or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to the, to the amendment. So turn it off if you don't want to talk to me. Right. Excuse me, Mayor. Did we have a second on that amendment? 
on the motion. I'll second it. So now we do. Okay. So nobody wishes to speak to the amendment. Okay. Councillor Franks. Since I'm the one who brought up the inordinate amount of time, and it's all perception, so I appreciate your perspective. That's that's not mine. Um, I'm not real comfortable with kicking the can down the road. It seems to me like we could find a way to just surgically take out a few words where the exact half just wasn't counted, where two years didn't turn into four, and we could get to the end of this. It just seems like we could just surgically pop out a couple words and get there. So <laughs> sorry about the shortness. I'm a little tired tonight, and it just we've been talking about this date counting for a really long time in my mind. <laughs> so. Okay, so I have listed to speak to the amendment councillor skilling vincent and beta is that accurate no. amendment councillor skilling as i just um explained to councillors harrison and abel i was going to say almost verbatim what councillor franks just said Great. um and it would go to speaking to the original if we're going to go back to the original motion i would have thoughts on that councillor beta well, the only thing I'd like to say as far as the amendment is, if we're going to take it to the people, I wouldn't want them to have a choice of either this uh, method or the day counting method. I mean, if we're going to give it to them, they should have a choice. So I think that would have to be a uh, <clears throat> like an amendment to the amendment, to, to not just send this to the people, but also uh, a choice to, uh, to go with the day counting method as well. All right, I will speak to the amendment. I will not be supporting it. We pushed this aside. We had a study session. Direction, consensus direction was given to come back with this form of language. If we're going to send stuff to the charter, we should actually look at a lot of different things that should be going to the charter. And I think there's actually a list in place of different things as the city has grown and changed. So I certainly will not. I ask that you please cast your votes on the amendment. That passes, fails, uh, eight nays, two ayes, the nays, Paul Johnson, Vincent Franks, Gutwine, Skilling, Harrison, Abel. So we'll go back to our original. So I have in, I wrote this down, I have counselors Vincent, Skilling, Beta, Gutwine, Harrison, and Abel. Counselor Vincent, this is to the main motion. To the main motion. Yes, please. Um, yes, I... You know, I have to look at the people that have talked to me, and they said, why in the heck are we talking about this? It did happen one time, day counting method. They said that when they go to vote, they know that that term is two years and you can run for one more. Um, they appreciate the fact of people having um, a lot of knowledge about council, a lot of depth about that, but they... Uh, my email blew up and so did my phone and at meetings they said distinctly if you choose to run for a two-year term you know that's two years and you should run for another four not two fours and a two um so i have to support that and they made it clear it didn't matter who it was but the intent versus the impact of of a two-year term and a four-year term is a lot different than two fours and a two Two four two four four by four, Councillor Skilling. Ten four. Um, so, I appreciate that Mr. Cox mentioned that they, staff didn't spend an inord inordinate amount of time on this, so that's good. Um, my concern with this is it's one in fifty years. So, as to Councillor Franks's point, I have no idea why we are spending so much time on this. However, with that said. The fact that people have such strong feelings on this, um, I probably underestimated the, um, the effect of this. And I think that there's still, I think this needs to be flushed out more. And also to Councillor Franks's point, I think we can accomplish a lot of what we heard by making, uh, taking a surgical approach to some of this. I don't think we'd need to send it to the people for a vote. 
Um, I think we can take into account what we heard from Councillor Johnson and others and maybe just improve upon it. But I have trouble voting on something that there still seems to be so much, um, I don't want to call it division because I think that's probably hyperbolic, but it's, there are some things that it sounds like are left unfinished by this proposal. Um, with that said, it's once in 50 years, so I don't want to get carried away, but at the same time, there is people, ha as Councillor Vincent, just my phone and email didn't blow up, but I have no doubt if, if there's a lot of that out there. So I, I don't know at this point what we do to take a step back, make some surgical amendments to it. I don't mind kicking the can on something that's once in 50 years. Councillor Bita. Thank you. So let me get a clarification if I could. As I understand it, when I wasn't on council, but this issue came up with uh, Councillor Johnson. And as I understand it, at that time, we used a uh, day counting method to determine that she was eligible to run. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, council, Councillor. Well, it, I mean, I think that's why we're here, right? We had what is a half term do you count the days or in in her method we ended up going with the day counting and so this was here to clarify uh, uh, the uh, once in a 50 year experience I, I just wanted to point out that the question asked by councillor Bita, I, I was i received direction to present the issue but i honestly don't know whether a determination was made by anybody as to what the terms were going to be it's just we have the situation we don't know what the answer sure. is uh, in, in this particular case, and there are at least two possible answers. So can you please present the options? And that's how I uh, learned about it. So are you saying there was no determina determination I, I, either way? Yeah, I don't as, know. As if, it applied to her, her situation. Right. I, I don't know if that's what set the wheels in motion. Was somebody making a determination that the days added up this way or that way, or, uh, or whether that count had been done at that point? Margie, I don't know if you were uh, involved in that, but... I, I could you repeat the question I'm sorry okay well my question was did um, we determine in Councillor Johnson's situation or uh, case that to apply the day counting method which then allowed her to um, go ahead and run for office because my understanding and rep, uh, recollection of the whole controversy was that her, was her position and her attorney's position. They were relying on the court uh, case that used the day counting uh, method. And so all that put together that the city decided, yes, we will use the court, the day counting method in her case. And I was just asking if that is correct. The city council did determine that. Okay. Um, and um, followed it up with, we need this definition in place for next time. Okay. So having done that, we've already set a precedent then of using the day counting method. We do have a uh, court case that understanding it's not binding on, I understand as a lawyer that it's not binding on the city per se, but nevertheless, it was a decision uh, by a court of law uh, that, that a day, the day counting method was appropriate with this kind of a situation. So my feeling is I don't know why we're going any further. We've got precedent. Uh, I, it seems to me if it comes up again in the next 50 years, we can say we already got precedent. Let's use the day counting method. Move on. If somebody wants to challenge it in court, fine, let them do it. But we've already got a way of doing it. We've done it once. It worked fine. Um, so I think the easiest thing to do here is for us to vote no, turn this thing down, and move on. And that's what I'm going to do. And I vote. I also agree with uh, Councillors Johnson's, Frank, uh, Roybal, and Skilling, and their uh, uh, their thoughts on this as well. And for clarification, no method was used. The idea was that nobody was going to be affected by any decision. So therefore, nothing was going to be used, and it was going to be brought forth to us, which you brought back. So. I misspoke. No, no method was used. Uh, Councillor Gu, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just to, to respond to the public comments and some of the things uh, raised by council members since then, um, the arguments that we heard from Mr. Wickman and, uh, and other speakers and from members of, of council are arguments against term limits. It's that the people should have the option to vote for someone with experience. 
hey, I may personally believe that. I may want the opportunity to vote for the same person several times over, but the voters of Lakewood in Colorado said, we want term limits. We want to, for whatever reason, we want to limit it to this number of terms. And our charter was amended by the people to say, so therefore, to, to figure out whether you've served a full term or not, we're going to measure by what's at least half a term in office. Then the, the Fitzgerald case came along that demonstrated how there can be ambiguity here. And two highly uh, qualified elected officials said they reached opposite conclusions about what the, uh, the method should be. Uh, we did not present the information in the, in the presentation tonight, but last time around we had a chart that showed in any given calendar year, if, you, if you're sworn in on this date, you're going to end up serving six years. If you're sworn in on that date, you're going to have the opportunity to serve 10 years. And it was completely arbitrary. And it's, as I recall, uh, the clerk saying, you won't even know at the beginning of the term whether someone's going to be on that side of the line or not. Um, so that's what brought us here. We're not arguing about whether term limits should be allowed. We're not arguing about whether uh, experienced council members should be serving longer than uh, rather than shorter. It's if you're trying to apply those term limits, how do you figure out whether someone is term limited or not? Thank you, sir. Okay. Councilor Gutwein. So just to clarify again, there we didn't actually uh, set a precedent by using the day method. What my rem the way I remember it is that we didn't want to impact someone in the middle of their election season, and so we decided we will make the decision afterwards. That's how it played out, yes. Okay. Um, I also feel quite tired of talking about this, regardless of how long it's been. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that we can just reach a decision tonight. Um, and I just want to make sure that um, tonight, I think it would be really great if we could limit the conversation to just how this is going to impact um, future candidates and not um, not use this as a bringing up again um, past elections um, because no matter what we decide moving forward, it doesn't reflect in any way on the past election that it, it's done. Um, and this is about moving forward. It, it, that that's what we decided to do. Um, also, I thought we did reach consensus on this. So I honestly was not expecting to go through this whole debate again. Um, but here we are. And um, this is the thing for me is that if we go with the day counting method, two things. Number one, we don't know at the beginning of the term if that will be, if that person will be eligible to run again or not. So when you sign up to run, it depends on what day we are sworn in. And that could be changed for any number of reasons. There could be a storm, there could be, I, at, we could have a majority of people with the stomach flu and we don't have a, uh, a quorum. I, or, you know, there's examples in Colorado history where people, um, or at least one person, uh, delayed their swearing in so that they could have an additional term. So for these reasons, um, and if I remember correctly, I thought that we had decided that what we need to do is go by the year method. When somebody is signing the affidavit, it will say, this is a two-year term. You can, you can run again for one more term. Um, if we do the day method, we cannot guarantee whether that person gets to run for only six years or 10. So it, it is the most fair way is the most clear way, is the most upfront way. We came to consensus. I would love to stop rehashing this. Can we please just vote for this and move forward with the other issues facing our community? Thank you. Councilor Harrison. Ditto. Um, I really like the, the uh, um, presentation in front of us because what it does is it actually clarifies it what isn't clear in the charter it may not be perfect 
but it's better than what's in there, the ambiguity that exists in the charter today. I think we can do it legally. I think this is what we need to do, and I'll be supporting it. Councillor Abel. <clears throat> A couple of things. First of all, I thought uh, Councillor Gutwein was about to give us a third option that is a meeting counting option where if a storm <laughs> interferes with a meeting, we Full have move. to leave it out of the count. Thank goodness you didn't go there. Uh, either one of these uh, things, Ms. Harrison, would be more specific than what we have now. So that said, uh, I prefer the day counting method, but I do think we need to make it clear on the ballot, as I said last time, that whenever somebody goes in to uh, uh, announce, uh, to, to pick up the forms to announce their candidacy for a replacement term, that they be told there and then whether they're going to be able to run for that second four-year term or not. I think it's very important, and I think the calendar doesn't change, so we can, uh, either of these methods would yield an idea as to whether it would be a two-year with no option for a second four-year term or whether it's two years and you get four or eight more possibilities so the calendar doesn't change thank you okay councillor franks uh, thanks mayor paul um uh, mr cox your point was well taken it, i think it is important that we are not looking at um doing away the citizens clearly wanted term limits i, I certainly want to respect that and uh, considering i'm not going to be wanting to run forever um you know term limits are great because you can say i can't run again so anyways just putting that out there um, so while I was here, I just stepped back and looked at the section 2.6, Terms of Office, Section B, and basically, if you re the plain reading of that is who serves at least half a term in office will be considered a full term. So when they contemplated that, it was sort of spelled out that two years would equal four. And if we just clarify when someone's signing up so they have full knowledge that they're signing up, and we can also put on there, there's nothing to preclude you from doing your two years and then four years on council and then running for mayor. So you can get your 10 years if you really want to go and run for mayor. So it just I, I just stepped back for a second and just reread that because it's very important for me not to to interpret in a way that violates maybe what the folks at the time that they improved the charter. And that section says at least one half of a term. Now how you count that, whether it be the day counting or whether you count that surgically by, by either way, they were contemplating that a half two years did equate to four. And so um, I can be comfortable with um, the fact that as long as we annotate that correctly, and I don't think it diminishes anybody's, you know, doesn't diminish the one experience that happened. You know, those these things come up and, and those methods. But we certainly need to call it out on the form. And we also need to make sure they're aware that they can continue on to higher office if they choose. I think I could get comfortable with that, especially since we're talking about this is not a common situation. And so, again, reading 2.6B, um, it seems to be clear that they chose to say at least one half would be considered to have served a term in office. Councilor Gowen, you had a question. I just wanted to ask if we did go through the, the day counting method, can we guarantee one way or the other whether that will be at least half or not, if I'm making sense? I, I recall discussing this with, with the clerk at length uh, as to the scenarios that can arise. And and she explained art, uh, eloquently to me uh, how you could be at the beginning of a partial term and not know how many days are going to be in that uh, in that partial term. And, and so it takes you right back to the very clear language that we don't know how to in uh, interpret because it's 
No one says what one half of a term is. But there are scenarios under which what, by the time you get to sign up for that next term, after having served the partial term, where it's a moving target, depending on the vagaries of the calendar. Um, and uh, you, well, you end up with, in, in different situations, someone landing on one side of the line rather than the other. And that's the whole point. That's why we're engaging in this. And, uh, you know, again, I would remind everybody that you're elected to four-year terms. So to say you serve two years, even if it's two days less than two years, but it's the day of the election that's, that splits your your term, that's two years. Uh, half of a, of a four-year period is two years, not the number of days. And uh, so in that respect, it's 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 clearer and more logical. But at this point, it, we're just trying to fix a, a hole in the roof while it's not raining. And uh, whichever way you choose to, to fix it, we, we just are suggesting that you do so that your successors don't have to go through this agony down the, down the road. Okay. Hey, um, so then based on that, and because I'm also remembering now we talked about an example of if the ballots took longer to cure or other reasons with the elections that, you know, it, it could end up taking longer. Um, so I, I really think it is important that people know up front what they are signing up for. Um, so thank you for that clarification. Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Well, when somebody's going to run for a half a term, they know what they're signing up for, and they will know ahead. And by using the day counting method, they will know if it is actually a half a term. Day counting is the most precise. It is the most mathematical. And whether you like going over this or not, I do not want to see anybody else go through the agony that I was pulled through two years ago. It never should have gone as far as it did knowing somebody was in play up here, period. The only reason that we even realized that there was a day counting process out there was because my attorney brought it to your attention. Yes, that is the case. He came to you in September and in August, and that's when the conversation started. Also, Dave Wickman brought it to everybody's attention, and it took how many months for us to actually get anything happen? Dana, you're absolutely right. One of the reasons it was pulled was because somebody was in play. It never should have gotten that far. And frankly, we were prepared to go to the mat on this and go to court. It would have been ugly, and it would have been very public. So that was one of the reasons it was pulled. We should stick with the day counting method. It's precise. It's mathematical. Yep. So, so uh, I'm going to speak because Councillor Johnson or Councillor uh, Abel, I haven't had a chance to. If that's okay. <laughs> and you know what? I don't care which way we go. Believe it or not, and and this way just. The one presented is the one that had consensus given to staff to go forth. It's the cleanest. It makes the most sense. And I will say I've heard a lot of I's and a lot of me's and a lot of I bring more if I get 10 years. That's not what this is about. In fact, this is purely political. If it was other people on this dais, I bet some of the folks up here would be arguing the other way. And I'm just going to throw that out there. And if we're going to point fingers and have a history lesson... You knew when you signed up that you were signing up to fill a term. You brought it up at the retreat and said, this is, we need to figure this out so somebody in my shoes won't have to deal with this again. This wasn't brought forth by Mr. Cox or by anybody else. It's an unfortunate situation, but it's not all about you. It's about the community, it's about the city of Lakewood and ensuring that our community doesn't have to go through this again because we have wasted an enormous amount of time and energy, as you have said. I feel for you, and I'm sorry, but there's no blame to go around. You brought this up at the retreat, and you said, we need to look at this and find clarification, and that's what happened. And if you want to go back, I've asked you if you want to go back and look at that time, that's fine, but we're not going to blame Mr. Cox, and we're not going to blame Ms. Hodson, this is a political body. This is a political move right now. 
And if anybody up here could say, if, if the roles were reversed, you think some of these people would be advocating the same way? And I think it's a really short-sighted argument to say, I deserve two extra years because I'm so smart. That's not what the people want. The people want two four-year terms, and this is the way we need to figure it out. So if we don't want to count days, that's fine. If we want to count days, that's fine. But can we please end this conversation I'd like to for the people the of our community? I'd like to call the question. Amen. There's a motion to call the question. Please count your votes. Cast your votes. All right. So that passes AI's two nays. Okay. Huh? The two nays were. That was called a question. The two nays were. I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Johnson and Beta. I. Well, what were we voting for? <laughs> to call the question or for the motion? You you called the question. That was to call the question. Oh, okay. okay. All right, wrong, wrong. so please cast your votes for the motion. For the motion is which method? Which method? The one presented by Mr. Cox or not? Thank you. Okay. Well, mine should be no. I, how do I take it off? I do not want, I do. Okay, I will clear. All right, so now we're voting for the motion. Passes six ayes, zero nays, the nays being Johnson, Beta, Roy Ball, and Abel. Six four. So this passed, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I thought so. General business? Anything? Councillor Abel, all right. If I had anything, what would you say? <laughs> Nothing. Okay, we'll go to reports. And uh, uh, the Action Center, just a reminder that October is a matching month for up to 17,000. It is awesome to report that Jeffco, Arvada, Wheat Ridge, and Edgewater have all joined in uh, with with helping to shore up their financial funding. Cider Days was a, an incredible event. Again, it continues to grow, and uh, I think it's just so well done. So many new things, new people to see. That was uh, very exciting. And then um, this is something that council is really going to want to talk about, but we have to potentially at least bring to the body a discussion about council and mayor pay per our code. And so I've asked Ms. Hodson to check in with the ACIC to see where they're at. But this is, is it every November before a mayoral election or? No. So this will be a popular conversation. But anyways, so we'll get you more information, but it is in the code that we need to have that discussion before November of, I believe it is a mayoral election. Ms. Hodson, are you going to? I'm, I've just looked it up. I'm sorry. I didn't no, know no, this no, was no, going to be mentioned. According to the municipal code, this November 2018. So it's the November prior to each mayoral election, which is what this year is. Um, the city council should review the mayor and city council members compensation. Uh, four years ago, just FYI, the decision was made to make no changes. So that needs to be done in November. So we'll look forward to that. And remember, we did give an assignment to ACIC. It may not be done. It may be done either way. Um, I would also like to just echo on the budget. I, I know there, there's, you know, we're all trying to get to understand it better and know things. I am proud to say that in my tenure, We've either come in right at or added to our reserves. And so, you know, going through this process, it's always, again, can be a learning experience. And I do welcome better conversations if there's other ways that folks think that we should do it. And then lastly, um, our last thing that we just passed, 
it's a challenge that we've been dealing with with this song, and I do understand, Councillor Johnson, where you are coming from. It just cringe that somehow it gets pointed at certain people, and I'm sorry that, again, that you had to go through that, but we've all sat up here and felt the pain, and I had to reiterate that this was brought forth at the retreat by you, and that's how we got to where we are. I agree. Okay. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. No report. Councillor Abel. Yes, sir. I, uh, on the 29th, attended the opening of a uh, unique new uh, facility over in uh, Commons, the Mathnasium. Uh, you know, if you're having problems with math, hopefully, even if you're my age, you can go over there and get help. And it is an entertaining way of learning. Also, uh, last week I attended the uh, Aging Well in Jefferson County workshop uh, where the bait, we discussed the needs of uh, older folks, folks older than me, I think. Uh, their basic needs, caregiving and supportive services, health, behavior health, uh, behavioral health, wellness and prevention, housing and transportation, and social and civic engagement. It was a well-rounded discussion. These folks have been working very hard on this all year long. So I thank them for that. Very cool. Councilor Harrison. Um, we had our Ward 5 meeting um, last Saturday, and I want to say thank you so very much to all the speakers who came and helped us review the ballot issues. Um, we had people there talking about the Jefferson County school funding. We had people talking about transportation funding. Um, thank you very much to the mayor who also helped clarify a lot of questions that our um, ward members had. You know, it's refreshing when you can have a talk and, a, and both sides get the opportunity to, to talk about their feelings and yet still walk out in the, in the parking lot and help each other carry things out and be neighbors and friends. Um, that's what we felt like on Saturday and it was pretty special. So I just want to say thank you to all those Word 5 people who came and participated and it makes me proud. Thank you. Councillor Skilling. I would echo that about Ward 1. I stopped in and saw the tail end of their meeting, and uh, I'm probably glad I wasn't there for the whole thing, but um, <laughs> everyone did seem to disagree, but they weren't disagreeable in doing it, and thank you for having me there. Um, thank you also to Councillor Franks for taking on our upcoming Ward 4 meeting this Saturday. Be there. 9.30 to 11, I will be out of town, but she will do a much better job than I would anyway. So we have that ward meeting coming up. Thank you. Councilor Gutwein. No. Councilor Franks. Didn't expect it to come around so soon, so just a second. Um, I did want to comment uh, just briefly on, on uh, the vote we just had. Um, I think that um, I, certainly everybody, I appreciate everybody's time. I am grateful that we will move forward, that candidates will have certainty when they come and sign up, and they can make that decision at that point, and that takes nothing away uh, from anyone um, along the way. I appreciate everybody's um, honest and passionate uh, discussion. Um, I did want to reiterate uh, what Mayor Paul said about the Action Center for October um, through this month. They are uh, raising those funds to hopefully get uh, that $17,000 match from the city. So if your budget permits, please consider a donation and be sure to note um, in the notes section that it's for the Lakewood Matching Program. Um, also, those of you may be um, able to get matching grants from your employer, as I was able to do, so please be sure to investigate that. Um, also, if you're not in a position where you can donate um, financially, please consider that if you've got some shelf-stable food or some clothing that you can donate, please uh, consider that. And they have identified the greatest need is for, again, men's clothing, since you guys don't turn over your closets as much as we ladies do. So please uh, consider that. Um, I also want to let you know that we have on Wednesday night the Ad Hoc Housing Committee, and we are not as well attended as the Development Dialogue, so I'm feeling a little left out. So, you know, you can come to our Ad Hoc Housing Committee. It's Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. in the CMO Conference Room here in this building on the second floor. 
And then also, as uh, Councillor Skilling said, the Ward 4 meeting is Saturday, 9.30 at Green Mountain Presbyterian. It will be an open forum. I do have a lot of announcements and certainly can help guide the conversation. People are very um, interested in the upcoming ballot, and we just think it's a good time for folks to have an open uh, discussion. And I don't know if I'm going to get the time right. I probably won't. But um, October 13th, uh, the League of Women Voters, are they not hosting a forum at Jefferson Unitarian Church where there's going to be a whole presentation? Can somebody make sure that we get folks out the time since we're not going to be at our ward going over very detailed ballot information? So we'll make sure that's posted online. Councilor Bita. No report. Councilor Vincent. Um, just a couple of things. Um, for sustainability, Morris Park, congratulations. They had a, a paint return that was very well attended. It was so good. It's amazing how, how many cans of paint you save just to touch up, and you've changed your room color twice since then. So that was very good. Um, on Thursday the 18th, uh, Two Creeks Neighborhood Organization will have their yearly meeting. Um, there'll be multiple presentations. Um, that's at 6.30. It starts at um, the church, Mountaineer Christian Church. Um, on uh, I, we, I will be doing the meeting this Tuesday at 40 West Arts from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. And then um, we're having a special Ward 2 meeting on October 23rd at 40 West Arts um, from seven to eight, uh, from six thirty to eight, I believe is the time, which yes is the same day as the review for the boards and commissions, which yes is the same day as the O'Kane meeting too. So I think you'll be attending that. Mayor Paul will be dispersed, um, and a special shout out to uh, Forty West Arts. Um, I think it was just amazing. They are they got on the tier for the SCFD, which is an incredible lot of work, and you really have to jump through hoops. And they are the first and the only arts district that has received funding. Um, so congratulations to all of them, because I know they've been working on it for a long time, and um, that's just great for, for Lakewood. Very exciting. <laughs> Councillor Johnson, I'm happy to carry your books and your bags to your car tonight. <laughs> You can carry me, too, if you want. <laughs> Gladly. Like to thank the candidates who came to our Ward 1 meeting last Saturday. It's a tough time in an election for the state candidates to actually uh, give to a Ward meeting. And I'd like to thank Charlie. He facilitated the meeting, and he also presented very nicely all of the the things on the ballot we did have honest and an easy discussion it wasn't it was very civil cool great all right anything else for the good all right we will adjourn at 10:20 agent hipwell thank you very much be safe